Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to our virtual event today. I'm Laura Kurgan, and I'm the director of the Computational Design Practices Program, and we are hosting this panel discussion today. So um, I'm super excited because, um, in fact, this is a new program. So everything we do this year, we do for the first time. And this is something that we're going to repeat every year, this future present symposium. And I'm really delighted to have um, four amazing participants today who I will introduce as we move along. But right now we have Imani Jacqueline Brown on the screen and Elaine Gann, who are going to be um, giving the first presentations. And also thanks to Adam Vosberg, who's also on the screen right now. He's the assistant director of the program and has helped to organize um, and conceptualize this panel discussion. So just before we start, just a little bit um, about the new program, um, just so that you all know what it's about. So we're a computational design practices program and you know that word design is right in the middle of um, of what we aim to do, but we're in an architecture school. And so um, we think about computation, mostly in terms of the built environment across all the scales of the social, the, um, digital and physical environments and what all of that means to, to each of our disciplines in the built environment. So we're a creative, um, critical and technical platform and program. And our students are creative technologists, they're activists, and they're entrepreneurs. And any combination of those three things, especially as they move out of the school, it's a very intensive uh, three-semester program. So we're also hyper aware that computation has done a lot of harm and a lot of good in the world. Um, and so here we are at this moment of the Future Present Symposium, which acknowledges that as with designers, we look closely at all the layers that constitute the present in order to imagine a better future. So um, we'll start and I'm going to quickly introduce Imani Jacqueline Brown. Um, she's at home at Columbia and she will be coming to give a lecture later in the semester. So hold on for that. But her undergraduate um, is from Columbia. She's an artist, activist and researcher from New Orleans living in London. She's currently a PhD candidate at the Queen Mary University of London and a research fellow with forensic architecture and an associate lecturer in the MA architecture at the Royal College of Arts. Her work investigates the continuism, continuum of extractivism, which spans from settler colonial genocide and slavery to fossil fuel production. Elaine Gann um, is someone I've known for around seven to eight years. Um, she is an artist theorist and professor who teaches at Wesleyan University in the science and society pro science in society program. That's a that's a you'll have to tell us about that. Um, she's co-editor of an interdisciplinary anthology, Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, Ghosts and Monsters of the Anthropocene from Minnesota in 2017. And she directs a multi-species world building lab, an experimental podcast about climate change. So I'm super thrilled and both of you um, will speak for about 20 minutes. Um, I'll ask the first question. Um, I, I hope that you'll ask each other um, questions so that it becomes a conversation. And we're also very happy to take questions um, from the audience as well. And Adam will moderate, moderate that through the, through the Zoom interface. Okay, so Imani, take it away. Thank you so much, Laura, Adam, and Lane. It's a pleasure to be here in conversation with you. So um, as Laura said, my work uh, investigates the continuum of extractivism, which spans from settler colonial genocide and slavery to contemporary environmental injustice and climate change. Extractivism is a cosmology, which is to say that it's a worldview that holds capitalist accumulation, value in the form of wealth as its chief principle. To extract value, agents of extractivism 
apply the force of segregation to divide and conquer existence, um, segregating human beings from our wider ecologies and black bodies from the body of humanity. Um, so the continuum of extractivism comes into visibility in the US state of Louisiana, my homeland. Um, and we can trace it um, by tracking the fossil fuel production cycle in reverse. So we begin here in Louisiana's coastal wetlands, the coastal zone, where over 10,000 miles of canals have been dredged in order to drill over 90,000 wells to reach oil and gas deep within the earth. Um, in this photograph, which I captured uh, in January of last year via a, a three-passenger uh, propeller plane, uh, you can perhaps just make out New Orleans, the Crescent City, against this uh, smog-covered horizon. We're looking here at the Lafitte oil field, once one of the most productive sources of oil and gas in the state, um, which offered one of uh, the most productive um, suites of oil and gas fields in the U.S. Um, and the Lafitte oil uh, field is um, one of the sites with the highest rates of coastal erosion in the state. And indeed, Louisiana bears one of the highest rates of coastal erosion in the world, a rate uh, of one football field, American football field, every 45 minutes. Uh, as a result of these oil and gas canals, we have lost over 2,000 square miles and counting of our precious land uh, since oil was first discovered in the 1930s. These oil and gas canals um, have a myriad of ecological impacts. Um, they impact more than human uh, communities um, by allowing salt water to funnel in from the Gulf of Mexico. The salt is ushered into uh, brackish and freshwater wetlands, killing the vegetation that holds sediment together as land. That sediment then disintegrates out into the Gulf of Mexico. Over time, even the spoil banks, the artificial levees created by the placement of dredged sediment on either side of the recently dredged canal, starts to fragment um, into the sea. So here you see photographs of these canals um, where even the canals themselves um, are uh, becoming increasingly um, indecipherable. Um, on the right, um, we see the impact of a hurricane passing over this canal network. Wetlands uh, offer a very critical function in the protection of more than human coastal communities from the impact of uh, the more frequent and powerful storms rolling in off the Gulf of Mexico. Um, wet, healthy wetlands actually absorb energy from these hurricanes, slowing them down, decreasing their force. Um, but these fragmented and desiccated wetlands um, are hit with this bomb force of the hurricane and quite literally explode. Um, from the 90,000 oil and gas wells in Louisiana's wetlands, um, over 50,000 miles of pipeline stretch upriver to a region known as the Petrochemical Corridor. Here there are over 200 of the nation's most polluting petrochemical plants, tank farms, and oil refineries producing a myriad of products, including fertilizer, um, which is produced here at the Mosaic Agrico plant um, in Donaldsonville, Louisiana, um, as well as, of course, aviation fuel and um, a myriad of plastics. Each of these facilities um, actually stands atop um, uh, at least one and usually several uh, now fallow, formerly slave powered uh, antebellum sugarcane plantations. And on each one of these uh, plantations, um, is at least one burial ground that uh, holds the remains of historically enslaved people. Today, we can find these burial grounds by identifying groves of trees, um, such as this one here. Um, so this continuum of extractivism um, is you know, not a concept that um, I've just pulled out of thin air. In fact, it is first articulated by the state itself, not in so many words. Um, but uh, this uh, issue of the Louisiana Conservation Review, a magazine put out by uh, the State Department of Natural Resources, um, has this very interesting anecdote um, buried in a 1938 uh, edition of the magazine. It says, the first chapter in the romantic history of natural gas in Louisiana begins with a picture of 15 husky Negro slaves laboriously toiling under a crude tripod on the banks of 
the uh, river at Bermuda, 10 miles south of Natchitoches. Um, and we can start to see actually the beginnings of this um, algorithmic governance um, that has been adopted and perfected by the fossil fuel industry um, in the era of enslavement um, with these um, documents that they call schedules, uh, early spreadsheets that are documenting the death rate um, of enslaved people on the plantation, uh, the production of um, uh, agricultural products um, per plantation, um, and calculating, uh, tabulating the number of enslaved people held on each plantation, often um, with no more than a, a tick mark to indicate a human life. Um, today, we have uh, these oil and gas permits um, that uh, map the trajectory of new pipelines and canal networks. Here's one from the Colonial Pipeline Company, again, um, self-articulating um, the uh, fact that the fossil fuel industry is heir to the era of, uh, to the logics and logistics of colonialism and slavery. Um, and uh, these permits actually go further to calculate uh, the amount of land that would lost uh, per um, acre of, of wetland dredged in order to um, create a canal or to lay a pipeline. So I wanted to bring more clarity, more visibility, um, to more legibility, actually, um, to uh, these, these, uh, this, this uh, fossil fuel production cycle and uh, the continuum of extractivism. And so I uh, worked with a um, good friend and colleague, Scott Eustace at Healthy Gulf, to get access to the data sets available uh, at the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, for quite a long time, uh, they had um, all of the permits for oil and gas uh, canals and pipelines, what they call um, coastal use permits available online. Um, as of April of 2021, those are no longer publicly accessible um, for um, a still unclear reason. But thankfully, I was able to download all of these data sets before they disappeared. And I spent most of the pandemic um, sorting them by company. Here you can see the inside of my QGIS, Quantum Geographic Information Systems. It's a free open source software that I learned to use um, during my master's studies, um, uh, dividing um, all of this, this um, kind of mesh of uh, hundreds of thousands of lines, each representing um, uh, the coordinate expressed in a permit. Um, and all of these permits are issued to over 100 oil and gas companies um, that are going through a constant process of um, uh, acquisition, merger, um, and succession. Um, so I wanted to uh, take all of this data and make it available to the Louisiana public because I realized that there was no way for folks to really um, grasp the immense scale of operations um, and devastation, um, nor to really understand uh, the specific role and responsibility of specific fossil fuel corporations. Um, so I used a software called Mapbox. Um, this is also free. Um, to use up to a certain point, and I in, uh, imported all of this data, and I used uh, corporate logos to map the oil wells of all of the carbon majors and other prolific corporations uh, in Louisiana. And I was really excited to find um, one pipeline that um, served as the perfect narrative device to enable the, uh, us to traverse the, wet, uh, the fossil fuel production cycle from this cluster of wells in the wetlands um, called the Chevron oil, uh, sorry, the Chevron wagon wheel, um, which is so called because uh, there are um, a number of um, circular uh, canals that are transected by over 50 um, spokes. And the, the circular canals are actually tracing the subaqueous geology, um, these uh, salt domes that actually um, squeeze up through strata of sand underneath the surface um, and uh, uh, form the, uh, the architecture around which oil and gas yields pool. And so these corporations finding the most cost-effective way to access oil and gas decided to dredge all around the perimeter of said salt dome. Um, Chevron's uh, predecessor corporations uh, dredged most of those wells 
Um, and over time, they all became a part of um, Chevron holding. Um, and we continue through this platform up to the Lafitte oil field where um, uh, users can see um, the, uh, an example of a well permit, um, which was issued by the state to Texaco, formerly the Texas company, now actually Chevron for a mere $50. Um, and we can actually start to see the dollar value of oil extracted from each well um, over uh, a sample of just 20 years. So I was able to access a sample of 250 um, wells um, that had production data over a 20 year period. Um, and I was able to um, calculate that um, uh, adjusting the um, amount to inflation, calculate the, the dollar value of oil extracted from each well um, over time. Um, converting uh, each of these figures into um, dollar uh, coins, we can then start to you know, step back and, and get a sense of the vast quantities of wealth um, extracted from all of these wells, um, extracted from Louisiana, which, mind you, is the second poorest and uh, perhaps incidentally, perhaps not the second blackest state um, in the United States. Um, and uh, we're cutting now across the narrative and, and it carries us to the petrochemical corridor, um, uh, to the terminus at Mosaic Agrico. Um, we've skipped over the whole part where it really goes into the deep history of slavery on this land um, and showing how um, the oil and gas industry has inherited these their uh, logics and legacies um, but ultimately here, it, it culminates with the legal doctrine of unjust enrichment, um, which says that profits that are made by um, one entity, um, uh, when profits are, are made by an entity um, by impoverishing another entity, those profits are unjust and need to be restituted. Um, so the platform ends there. And uh, my work, oops, excuse me. My work then continues on um, from that point through a collaboration with Forensic Architecture, um, uh, an investigation called Environmental Racism in Death Alley, Louisiana. Um, this region called the Petrochemical Corridor has also been known over the decades, um, uh, first as Cancer Alley due to the fact that um, uh, the residents there bear some of the highest cancer risks in the US um, due to the um, uh, massive quantities of carcinogens released by these facilities. And most recently, um, local fenceline community activist group Rise St. James, along with the concerned citizens of St. John the Baptist Parish, renamed the region Death Valley. And we at Forensic Architecture thought that this was a really um, key um, uh, framing uh, concept um, for uh, this continuum of extractive violence. Um, the fact that death has been the chief product um, of industry in this region since the era of slavery. Um, so in order to uh, express the stakes um, of this investigation, I will pass the mic over to Rye St. James. My name is Sharon Levine. I'm the director and founder of Rye St. James right here in St. James Parish. And we are here to commemorate the graves of our enslaved ancestors. We're going to stand together. That's right. And we're going to fight for Mosa. That's right. We will not allow them to take our ancestors out of this ground yeah. and put them somewhere else. Right. We are rise St. James, and we're going to stand up for St. James Perry. This is our home. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. For Mosa has a, have a fight on their hands. Mm. Yeah. So as Sharon Levine, uh, one of our key partners articulated, um, a new company has decided to move in um, to the petrochemical corridor um, into Death Alley. Um, they wanted to construct a 3.5 square miles uh, Nurdles production facility, um, Nurdles being the smallest unit of plastic production. Um, and uh, members of Rye St. James, including Sharon, including Gail LaBeouf, had been saying um, from the beginning that there were burial grounds on that site. Rice St. James and the Center for Constitutional Rights teamed up with an archaeologist, Don Hunter, um, and looked into the cartographic record and were able to um, find evidence that indeed there were 
three burial grounds on Formosa site, um, and also one additional burial ground on the adjacent um, facility uh, grounds owned by Mosaic, which is where um, the pipeline in my mapping project terminated. Um, so forensic architecture was asked to intervene, um, to bring visibility to the contemporary condition um, that residents of St. James and other parishes in the River um, District of Louisiana are being subjected to by existing industry and the threats that they would face if Formosa and other pending plants were actually given construction permission. We began by working with Imperial College London um, to visualize um, the emission of six um, criteria and toxic air pollutants um, from 33 facilities within a 60 kilometer area. Um, this 3D fluid dynamic simulation um, uh, looks at um, three different prevailing wind conditions on three different days um, and simulates the movement of those um, uh, particulates, um, both carcinogens and um, PM 2.5 particulate matter, um, which have a range of impacts on uh, the respiratory, endocrine, reproductive, um, uh, system. Um, and it shows that, you know, the, for the majority of the time, um, the emissions are directly um, overhanging majority Black communities. But importantly, in certain wind conditions, uh, those plumes shift direction and are also subsuming the majority White communities who themselves have voted against construction in their own neighborhood, voted for construction in majority Black communities. Um, so it really helps to reveal um, a key, uh, something key that Sharon Levine likes to say, and it's that toxic air does not obey political borders. From here, we knew that we needed to travel back in time in order to locate burial grounds. And so we sourced um, maps from uh, the U.S. Coast Survey and the Mississippi River Commission um, from 1878-1894. These are post-bellum maps. Um, but they help to um, bring visibility to the calcified land use practices um, that are actually um, still largely in place today. Um, so we uh, scoured these maps um, and we learned the spatial logic that dictated the organization of um, the typological sugarcane plantation in the lower Mississippi River Delta. On some of these maps, plant, uh, antebellum cemeteries are actually mapped, albeit using a um, uh, inconsistent symbology. Um, and then we pulled aerial photographs from six decades, um, starting with the 1940 aerial image set, which was the most important because it was the closest to the end of the cartographic map series that we found. So it enabled us to continue our spatial analysis um, into the 20th century to the point right before the advent of the petrochemical um, era. And here we were able to identify um, a number of, we were able to travel forward in time from the 1940s, um, then into the petrochemical era up to today, bringing us up to the present when satellite imagery takes over. So in these map and uh, aerial photographs, we were able to identify what where burial grounds were um, uh, in the postbellum map um, and see what they looked like in contemporary um, satellite imagery, mostly appearing, as you saw in that photograph at the beginning of my um, talk, um, in the form of groves of trees. And indeed, we were able to identify over 1,000 um, sites that um, need to be, that, that demand further ground research through careful archeological survey um, to determine whether these are um, possible burial sites or sites of other um, otherwise um, cultural and historic significance. For example, the remains of uh, the ruins of uh, the slave quarter and sugar mill complex. Um, though, uh, over 1,000 sites that we identified in the 1940 aerial mosaic have been reduced to just over 300 sites by the time we get to the contemporary satellite images. And that's because many of these sites, and this is a sample of six um, groves that are highly likely to be antebellum black burial grounds based on their um, location in relation to 
the slave quarters and other structures on site um, have been over time encroached upon by industrial development or otherwise ongoing plowing um, over the course of the last decade. And this plight, um, this practice of erasure of Black cultural, spiritual, um, and historic sites also applies to Black communities. Front, uh, fence line community, or excuse me, free town communities that grew up um, adjacent to uh, the sites of their former enslavement um, have become today's fence line communities, like the community of Lions here, which has been encroached upon by uh, Marathon Petroleum Company um, Corporation and Cargill Inc., um, which now uh, owns almost all of the land of the former Lions community. Um, and has completely surrounded two historic cemeteries. Um, these ones here actually have crypts on site, indicating that these are likely antebellum cemeteries that remained in continuous use in the postbellum era. And somehow, uh, perple uh, there, somehow um, Marathon Petroleum Corporation uh, actually owns a quarter of one of these um, cemeteries. Um, I tried to gain access to these two cemeteries when I was last home, um, but the public road has been blocked off by the corporation. And finally, we, uh, we and when I say we, I mean my dear colleague, Sam and Emma um, brilliantly used software um, called Grasshopper um, in order to factor in all of these different um, spatial logics that we identified in our research in order to determine which areas of um, this 60 kilometer area, which portions of the plantation are most likely to hold antebellum cemeteries. Um, and so we were able to place our anomalies identified in the 1940 aerial set on top of those, um, uh, on top of that probability field um, and place it in relation to, um, in this kind of gray outlined in red, um, planned industrial development in order to see which possible antebellum burial sites are at most risk from the continued uh, encroachment of harmful industry. And this work has um, now been used in uh, uh, various legal suits, um, including an ongoing legal suit um, against Greenfield uh, Development, which is trying to um, construct an industrial grain terminal um, exactly on um, uh, this site here. And most recently, a Louisiana judge um, responding to the um, demands of Sharon Levine and other local residents um, that, you know, their, their ancestral land, their communities, their living communities not um, be imperiled by this development. A judge actually said that um, the land that has been worked by historically enslaved people, um, that has been watered by the blood, sweat, and tears of them, um, is sacred. Um, unfortunately, because Louisiana um, is under um, civil rather than common law, there is no precedent set by this legal um, decision, but it is impactful all the same because most importantly, it opens onto a realm um, of value that is not computable, that is incalculable, much like when we have conversations about the loss and damages as a result of environmental degradation and climate change, we have to grapple with the fact that the harm caused by the fossil fuel industry, the harm caused by slavery um, is utterly incalculable. So when, when we make demands for reparations, when we use um, computational analysis to make demands for um, the repair um, of harm done um, through financial settlements, we have to understand that that financial settle settlement can only um, help to improve the conditions um, of life for the living. Um, it is not the be all and end all. Ultimately, um, we need something much more. Um, what we need is um, a new um, value system, a new cosmology um, that uh, actually um, works against the violence of segregation that conceives of ecological reintegration um, with our more than human communities, that reintegrates Black human beings within the body of humanity, reintegrates humanity within our um, wider ecological bodies. Um, and uh, only then um, can we start to repair the harm that has been done through um, this uh, 
this, uh, the, the continuum of extractivism over the past uh, 300 years and set ourselves on a new course um, for the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Imani. And so Elaine, welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Imani, for uh, the powerful, really powerful presentation. Um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, excited to be uh, in a conversation uh, with Laura. Laura's practice has really inspired my own uh, for many years. Uh, so it's a real gift um, to be here. So thank you. Uh, I work uh, in the fields, uh, actually, let, let me uh, share my screen. All right. Um, so um, I work in the fields of feminist science and technology studies, uh, or STS, environmental humanities and uh, digital arts. Uh, I don't see those as uh, distinct fields, but as uh, porous and uh, reciprocal methods for uh, engaging with uh, complicated uh, phenomena. I also don't see the arts or uh, my creative practice as an end product or what comes after research. Uh, rather, it's very much uh, something that shapes the research. Uh, so I see art as a method. Uh, I am going to talk about crops. Uh, these are likely not the first things that come to mind uh, when you think about computation. So I'm gonna walk you through um, some of my work uh, with two uh, particular crops. The first is a flowering grass that most of us here uh, call rice. Uh, over the last 10,000 years, different varieties of rice, uh, we can uh, call them cultivars uh, for short, uh, so the different varieties have co-evolved uh, with people, species, uh, machines, and landscapes. They now feed half of the people in the world. They cover uh, about a quarter of the world's land surface, and they're one of the largest sources of methane, uh, which is a greenhouse gas. Uh, the second crop is the American chestnut tree, uh, once dominant in forests of the eastern United States. It's now nearly extinct, uh, but it's returning in the form of a transgenic crop uh, in the next few years. So I consider these two crops as living organisms that are also uh, techno-scientific machines, as well as data. Uh, and by that, I mean their genomes that are sequenced, edited, and patented. Uh, crops are hybrid beings, and uh, they call for hybrid modes of critical inquiry and creative analysis. So what happens to these two crops has huge impacts on how we uh, live and die. Yet we know little about them and the assemblages uh, through which they come into being. So I'm going to start with uh, rice. Uh, in 1960, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations uh, launched the International Rice Research Institute or ERI uh, in the Philippines, a former colony of the United States and Spain. Uh, learning from experiments with wheat in Mexico, scientists at ERI developed uh, what was called miracle rice or new varieties of fast growing high yielding crops. Miracle rice relied on uh, what were called modern inputs or a new package of imported chemical fertilizers. It'd be interesting to see actually how many of those come from uh, Louisiana uh, that, um, and the petrochemical corridor that uh, Imani just mentioned. Um, but they relied on imported chemical fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation networks, and of course, uh, farmer loans. The name was well coined and it stuck. IR36, the most widely planted variety, seemed supernatural. Its yields were six times more than the average yield of one to three tons per hectare and its grains were ripe for harvest in 100 days. That's less than half the time of many uh, local varieties. So by the early 1970s, miracle rice varieties were all over Southeast Asian uh, fields. This switch from local varieties or land races exchanged between farmer collectives to miracle rice distributed by crop institutes and government agencies was called a green revolution. This name is misleading uh, because it actually was a turn to industrialized Western facing uh, food science and agrotechnology. 
Uh, scientists like to say that rice was or is the engine of this green revolution. But what keeps rice in place is a belief in uh, productivity or yield. Calculations of yield, which means the highest number of grains in the shortest amount of time, became the primary metric, the primary measure um, for a successful cultivar. This meant that rice breeders could develop a list of key traits, a kind of algorithm for producing what could then be tracked as better and better cultivars. So this algorithm, um, now a material expression of a belief in yield, now defines and drives most of the world's monocultured, monocultured, monocultured fields and infrastructure. This algorithm is visible in the bodies of today's rice plants. They are short, they have sturdy stems or um, stalks, and they have upright leaves. They have larger grains, to name just a few of these traits. That algorithm um, and these crops uh, give shape to many of, field, many of the fields uh, like you're seeing here uh, around the world. What is less visible um, is the erosion of genetic diversity in rice fields. This loss or the dis disappearance of local, local farmer land races also defines uh, rice, uh, rice fields today. Um, so we'll take a look at some of these uh, kind of uh, absences. So writing about rice in Indonesia, an anthropologist, James Fox, made a striking diagram of genetic erosion or the loss of biodiversity. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, this diagram quickly. Fox traced back to one parent uh, called China. It's a Chinese variety grown in Java in 1914. That's the yellow highlight uh, on the upper left. And then moving towards the right, you're going to see uh, various crossings made between 1940 and 1980. So the crossing of China with a Bengali variety, Latisal, uh, by the Dutch uh, Indonesian uh, breeding program uh, in 1940 is one of the most significant events in crop histories. The crossing uh, produced sturdy stemmed quick growing varieties, one of which was called Peta. 20 years later, PETA was crossed with a short Taiwanese variety named DGWG. That crossing produced IR-8, the first miracle rice from Erie. By 1975, half of Philippine rice fields were planted with genetic derivatives of China. By 1981, more than three quarters of Philippine rice fields were planted to these same Erie varieties. 90% of those fields were sown with just one variety, and that was IR36, uh, which you see on the screen. Uh, so genetic erosion, coupled with a heavy reliance on new inputs like fertilizers, um, which I'm not gonna get into uh, today, uh, but genetic erosion turned fields into factories, putting significant pressure on longstanding coordinations between people and multi-species assemblages. A factory schedule came to be inscribed onto rice fields. So production manuals for rice uh, reduced uh, its life cycle as a plant into this single timeline that you see here. Um, so instead of multiple temporalities operating in rice fields, you suddenly get one point in time uh, that matters, and that's the time of harvest. Um, so the shift to monoculture or monotemporality had uh, disastrous effects. So multi-species assemblages responded to these new pressures. Ordinary insects that live with rice, uh, like the brown plant hopper that you see uh, on the left side of your screen, uh, flourished with the explosion of chemicals and uh, genetically similar plants. Um, so what you see on the right side of your screen is actually now rice fields that are uh, that have uh, what's called hopper burn. Um, bacteria, fungi, and viruses also evolved uh, relentlessly. So breeders, pathologists, and other scientists at Erie now describe their work as a kind of arms race, quote unquote, um, and it's an arms race against these more than human agencies. We can say that these arms races are now what's reshaping and recomposing our uh, crops. 
So the reduction of rice as a living plant into a food producing machine has huge effects. We inherit and live, uh, uh, live in and uh, consume those effects, which we can perhaps call the yield-based algorithms uh, of the green revolution. Um, so I'm going to leave uh, rice fields uh, for now, uh, and I'm gonna shift uh, to the second crop. Uh, which brings us closer to, uh, to where we are today in the uh, East Coast of the United States. Um, this second crop, the American chestnut, elaborates on uh, computation in a different way. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is the American chestnut tree. Um, and I first became intrigued uh, with this tree in 2019. Uh, this is a mushroom walk uh, with the New York Mycological Society in Kissena Park uh, in Flushing, Queens, which used to be uh, the center of uh, horticulture uh, in the United States. So one of the club's uh, best mycologists on this walk, uh, whose name is Tom Bigelow, casually mentioned that we were foraging on the former grounds of plant nurseries uh, that had supplied the trees for New York's first parks. That includes Central Park in Manhattan and Prospect Park in Brooklyn, uh, designed, as, as some of you uh, know, by Frederick uh, Olmsted and Calvin Quill. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, there was huge interest in exotic ornamental trees from Asia. So this is also the, the era of colonialism, of course. Uh, nursery shipments to Queens included uh, Chinese and Japanese varieties. So inadvertently, the shipments carried uh, this hitchhiker. Um, it's a bright orange fungus uh, against which uh, American chestnuts had never evolved immunity. So in less than 50 years, billions of American chestnuts succumbed to fungal blight. What had been known as the beloved queen of forests uh, is now nearly extinct. Uh, it's considered functionally extinct uh, in the Eastern United States. So these are some of the photos uh, that I just found online to show how massive uh, the trees were. So my mushroom club and I were walking uh, in the presence of ghosts. Uh, these were the ghosts of American chestnuts and their lost multi-species companions. And I wanted to meet them. So over the next few months, I pieced together accounts of the blight and efforts to control its spread. From biologists and foresters, I learned uh, that the fungus releases an oxalic acid that seeps into the tree through breaks in the bark, enabling the fungus to eat its way through uh, and eventually strangle parts of the tree growing above ground. Now, bacteria in the soil keeps the fungus at bay, protecting the roots. So one tree at a time, forest canopies changed uh, while tree roots underground uh, remained intact. Now, from historians and humanists, I read of the impact on people's livelihoods as blight swept through Maine to Mississippi and all along the Appalachians. So from indigenous scholars uh, like uh, Neil Patterson, uh, who's a member of the Tuscarora Nation and also uh, director of the uh, Center for Native Peoples of the Environment at SUNY in Syracuse, uh, from in so from indigenous scholars, I learned that the devastation of um, Chestnut forests coincided with longer histories of genocide, dispossession, and the forest assimilations of native peoples, uh, particularly the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, including the six nations of the Onondaga, the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Cayuga, Oneida, and Tuscarora. Uh, so these are, these are maps uh, from Neil Patterson showing uh, those overlaps uh, of Haudenosaunee and chestnut assemblages uh, up until the 18th century. Uh, by the early 1900s, uh, American chestnut trees were dying. They were becoming ghosts as if in solidarity uh, with the silenced languages, the dismembered bodies, and the repressed dances and dream worlds that once animated and inhabited them. The livelihoods that were being lost to blight in the 20th century were those of Dutch and British settlers and more recent immigrants from Ireland and Germany who had left behind crop failures, famine and disease uh, in search of better futures on this side of the Atlantic. 
So loss is differential and even and unjust. So the question arises then, with whose loss and whose grief should I or we engage? And for whom uh, would this work uh, matter? As I dug deeper, I learned that a different trajectory had opened in the 1990s. Uh, geneticists at SUNY ESF, it's College of Environmental Science and Forestry, experimented with ways to bring the trees back. Um, this is uh, Bill Powell of Powell Lab at ESF. Um, and he led this group uh, that kind of solved the puzzle uh, over the next two decades, opening up a path to de-extinction or chestnut restoration. Using bacteria to introduce a blight tolerant gene from wheat uh, into chestnut embryos, they genetically modified the American chestnut, uh, giving it the ability to produce oxalic ox ox oxalic ox oxidase. It's a protein that can detoxify the fungus's oxalic acid. So this transgenic embryo was named Darling 58, which is uh, what you see on your screen here. They're the Darling uh, demonstration trees. They were named Darling 58s in honor of its first backer. So the long process of securing government approval uh, has begun. To deregulate the transgenic tree, uh, teams have been testing, analyzing, and computing multiple variables in field stations, experimental plots, and labs. And you're seeing some of those here uh, from field work in 2021. Uh, three agencies now oversee this move for deregulation. That's the Department of Agriculture, the EPA, um, and the Food and Drug Administration, which in itself is an index of the tree's ontological multiplicity as a crop, as a companion species, and as food. Approval from all three agencies would permit uh, what's called open release, and that means plantings of the darling trees in lands uh, where they can cross freely, right? They can cross with the few remaining American chestnut trees that have managed to survive in the wild. That ideally uh, would produce some blight tolerant offspring while man maintaining uh, genetic diversity. Um, so ESF has not patented the tree and they haven't sought to privatize it. Uh, these are, there are close ties between ESF and the American Chestnut Foundation, which connects volunteers in 30 chapters in states like New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Uh, the aim is to give the transgenic chestnuts away, so it's to circulate them and have the transgenics uh, um, freely make their way, uh, find their own companions uh, without human monitoring. So government approval for this is expected within the next five years. So the chestnut tree being once the dominant tree is kind of gonna significantly impact uh, the forest that it's gonna uh, now be introduced to. Um, I'm gonna end here um, really with a call uh, to participate. Uh, so crops like rice and the American chestnut uh, embody different computational logics and more than human agencies and crops cover a significant part of the world. How they live and die uh, matters uh, greatly, and they require new kinds of methods, algorithms, and modes of representation, as well as cultivation. These processes with rice uh, and chestnuts that I've described are ongoing, and they're parts of, of huge uh, projects, uh, which I can get to in discussion. Um, so we need to be able to trace uh, how they work in order uh, to imagine how to farm uh, and feed other ones. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, both of you. I cannot, <laughs> what an amazing um, dialogue between, between these two presentations and, you know, such kind of different, different and similar um, uses of um, of computation and um, and the understanding of the of the harm that that computation has done um, in the past to do the measuring and transformation and algorithms that are ruining things, but at the same time using some of those same tools to recapture and reclaim and to bring and to bring diversity back. 
So Imani, I think, you know, it was so powerful how you showed, um, you know, it was almost, I often tell my students, you know, you don't just look at data, you have a hunch about the data and the trees where the burial sites were is was, you know, only um, something that a local, that a local community knows and understands, right? in relation to this larger landscape. And so the imperative to actually put that on a map to do whatever it, you know, to, to start the reparations in the future. And then, you know, the same with you, Elaine, the, the um, you know, just the, the efficiency of the factory rice um, and then the death of the trees, but in some ways using that same, DNA, the DNA methods to revive and to re-diversify and to diversify um, the forest afresh. So I don't know, I just wonder if you have um, questions for one another about, about methods, because there's so many, there's so many similar themes, but you come at it from such different disciplinary angles. You know, even in terms of how you make th how you make things, because you know, Elaine, I know you actually make projects, um, you know, with computation, but this one is so much more analytical and going into the background of how things are made, and uh, the same with you, Imani. Um, I guess to start, perhaps just one quick clarification, or perhaps a nuance and wrinkle in. Um, uh, the understanding of how the burial grounds were located. So um, one of the biggest problems in Louisiana is that all of these former plantations remain private property. Mm -hmm. So in fact, there is not um, a way for locals uh, to investigate all of these sites um, on the ground on their own. It would require the permission of the landowners, many of whom are industrial um, you know, corporations, developers, many of whom um, have their properties on the market for industrial development and are seeking um, uh, industrial development on that property. And many others, of, you know, who are, who are, you know, just uh, maintaining, you know, contemporary agricultural corporations and also right. don't want to be disrupted um, by the discovery of um, any kind of a cultural site um, on their property, which would impede their own plans for development. Um, so there is really, you know, very little incentive um, for property owners in Louisiana to grant access to local residents. And local residents have, in fact, been chased off properties by men in uh -huh. pickup trucks with shotguns, as, you know, is done in right. the U.S. South. Um, so, you know, the, the, the first, the knowledge that there are burial grounds on these plantations is definitely very deeply held. Um, where they are um, and um, how to find them remains, you know, an ongoing research question for, um, you know, the, the few remaining local genealogists. They know that um, sometimes they can find burial grounds in overgrown plots, um, but there is a deeper reality and reason for these um, uh, plots to be vegetated to actually um, hold trees um, of really specific species like magnolia and, and live oak trees. Um, and it's because enslaved people planted those trees um, to mark those grave sites. Um, and this is a, a, some knowledge that is not um, uh, so, um, it's, it's, it's not so widely known any longer. It's something that yeah. has been huh. um, lost over okay. time and, and is actively being recovered. Right, that's well, yeah, that's even more powerful than that you're actually bringing that knowledge back through the same mechanisms which erase, you know, which erase it through the same processes. Yeah. Elaine, do you have any? Yeah, I think um, maybe just to add, uh, I was quite interested in, um, you know, interdisciplinary sources. Uh, where you go to find uh, data for things that have been made invisible, right, or that have been erased. Um, and also, I think looking to 
alternatives for future crops um, or future ways of uh, 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 feeding uh, or building the world, right? Um, and so I'm quite interested in collaborations. Um, something that I did not mention is um, uh, these rice fields actually have both uh, the miracle rice varieties, commercial varieties, as well as traditional varieties, right? So it's not a past uh, that's ended and now the introduction of, of new kinds of varieties. In very many cases, those coexist. Um, and so there's a kind of the use of genetic sequencing to actually find out what, how are these working together? Uh, how are these uh, claims for yield actually substantiated? Um, and so it's using kind of, as you said, Laura, kind of the very same tools of computation that have led to these environmental degradations, how to kind of repurpose them in order to look for uh, new kinds of collaborations. I think those are they're hugely interesting. So I actually yeah. scientists at the Rice Research Institute um, in yeah. very, very different conditions uh, from, from what Imani um, is, is working with. Uh, but for me, it's kind of thinking about, you know, breeders and geneticists and do we have frameworks for actually thinking about the complicated realities that now make up our landscapes, right? Things are coexisting. They're not one in the past. And now we get to kind of uh, move into a clean slate, right? Where they're really messy and we've got to find ways of uh, articulating them. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I'm um, trying to think of how to ask this question, Elaine, like, I, I wonder how you feel about the transgenic chestnut as we think about the very um, rich and complex, you know, human and plant matrices that make up the, you know, the past of, of this plant and its relationship with, you know, indigenous peoples in the area. And we think about trying to bring it back through, you know, um, uh, genetic, you know, manipulation, you know, it's, it's, it, there are so many questions that, that come up in terms of, you know, how, like, what is this plant? Like, what is this chestnut? Can it really be said to be the, like, regenerated, you know, um, chestnut of, of old? What does it mean to have a human kind of, um, uh, the, the, you know, like the, the, the human footprint or like, in, you know, like, uh, like fingerprint on another species and, and its existence, right? It's, it's um, genetic existence, its, its ability to like be in the world. I guess I wonder, and you know, and of course there there is so much, you know, there 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 are attempts to experiment, you know, um, with um, manipulating human genes, and it's in incredibly ethically, you know, fraught, right? But not so much so with non-human species. And so I just wonder how you, you know, kind of navigate these these different. Um, questions and and um, yeah, like like ethical kind of um, conundrums, but also kind of like I guess eco philosophical kind of conundrums. Yeah, I, I should mention that there is also a transgenic rice. Um, it's called golden rice, and that has actually been approved and is set for release in the Philippines also in the next five years. Um, so where do I stand? Um, I. I think as a researcher uh, who thinks critically and also creatively, my position is actually that we need to get involved in these conversations, um, that it's difficult to use the same critiques of the past to think about these novel organisms that are getting approved. Um, many of the fields and rice, many of the rice fields and also forests are so disturbed, are so degraded, um, that in order for something to survive, uh, they need a huge amount of fertilizers, for example. Um, so organisms come with their worlds and they come with their assemblages. Um, so I think my position is how do we uh, kind of embark on the kind of projects that I think you're doing, right? How do we actually situate them, how do we map out all their different entanglements? So we can start to see if it gets planted in this location, uh, for whom are we actually planting it? Um, who gets to benefit, who gets, you know, who loses out? I think those are 
kind of really specific questions that we haven't even started to ask. Um, we're still at this kind of binary of uh, traditional varieties are uh, perhaps uh, good and fertilizer dependent ones or transgenics are uh, bad or perhaps the reverse, right? Uh, but how do we kind of address the whole spectrum of uh, assemblages that are now getting introduced. Um, again, anthropogenic disturbance is so widespread uh, that kind of we need more sophisticated ways of collaborating and working uh, across different kinds of institutions. Um, so I don't have a solution. Uh, I have much more of a call to pay attention to these indeterminacies. Um, and how do we map those indeterminacies and erasures? Um, how do we make uh, more complex uh, connections uh, visible uh, so we can uh, make decisions moving forward? Uh, but yeah. maybe I'll okay. turn that question. No, I think I think it's a very it's a it's a super long debate that would um, that could ensue from from the from yeah from the from the positions, so. Yes, yes. Um, okay, we have many questions um, from the audience. How do we, how yeah, do we, we sort through? In. Yeah, we got a few in. I'll just kind of queue some up. So, um, oops, I just hit it live on accident. So I have yeah. a question from Diogo here that I'll just read out. It says, hi, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question to Amani. How are you managing data rights of archival material into open source archives, databases that allow this information to be accessible to the communities and allow future processes of reparations to be developed and supported? Many thanks. Um, in terms of uh, data rights, I mean, like, so a lot of the materials, because of their age, are, you know, now in the public domain. Um, the problem with them is how to, where they live in the world, like, you know, and um, how to kind of collate them and bring them all together in one place. Um, so, for example, you know, slave schedules are actually now all owned, as well as like the very censuses are, are owned by these, um, like, not 23andMe, like these kind of like Ancestry.com type corporations, and you can access them all for free. And you can download them, and there's the, there the new archive um, of, you know, this uh, this information, which is quite bizarre. So it's nice to kind of, um, you know, remove and reorganize those materials from one space to another. Actually, you know, like a data repository is one goal of the project that hasn't yet been um, actualized. There's a whole range of ex-slave narratives, a project that was conducted by the um, Works Progress Administration um, in 1939, 1940, with um, you know the um, kind of last um, living uh, people who were enslaved in their lifetime, and um, those were all supposed to be passed over to the Library of Congress, and so they're all public access, except. For some reason, the Louisiana documents never made it to the Library of Congress, which is quite typical if you know anything about Louisiana. Um, so not surprising, but so like that's an effort of trying to like go through all of the various um, institutions that now hold those and um, bring them together. Um, archaeological reports, you know, that we also use as a key resource are held by the Louisiana Division of Archaeology, but they're inaccessible. Um, uh, they're supposed to be public access, um, like publicly accessible. But in order to access them, you have to prove to them that you are a quote unquote legitimate researcher, um, which means um, ultimately that local residents are often barred from gaining access. Um, so these are, I mean, like kind of major systemic issues with, you know, data access. There's, you know, one can say like that such and such a material, the maps as well. I mean, it's like really a matter of like who has archived them, where are they, how can you access them, even if they are ostensibly publicly accessible, doesn't mean that you can actually get your hands on them. So yeah, it's a big issue. And I think in terms of the question for about reparations, um, you know, there's um, a local genealogist, Lenora Gobert has been, you know, trying to trace the individuals who are actually within um, these burial plots um, through court records and church records. And it's the same situation where, you know, sometimes you'll be granted access and sometimes, you know, you will not. And it really depends on 
um, you know, like sometimes uh, which, you know, archivist, you know, which um, person you speak with, um, but there's a lot of systemic racism kind of encrusted in these um, archival organizations that prevent um, this kind of work. Um, so, so yeah, like, I mean, kind of democratizing access to these types of materials, getting one's hands on them and then making them, um, you know, holding them in one place and making them accessible um, is like, would do a lot of work um, toward uh, supporting struggles for reparation. Um, here's a question for Elaine. Um, I come from a state that continues to follow agricultural policies rooted in colonial thoughts of monoculture, and it's become detrimental to both socioeconomic conditions and soil quality degradation. How would you show the opportunities in different types of agriculture and address it at a policy level? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> wow, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Yes, big question. Um, I can talk about, um, I, I'm not sure where, where you're from, um, but I can talk specifically about uh, location in the Philippines, uh, for example, uh, where uh, we are I'm collaborating with um, Philippine rice researchers and breeders and, uh, and also local farmers. Uh, we're trying to compare uh, uh, how actually farmer land races do all inputs and outputs considered uh, versus uh, monoculture fields and how they do. Um, surprisingly, those kinds of studies had never been done because it was always assumed that the output, that grain yield was the single measure. Um, and that modern varieties, meaning these commercial varieties, um, were the way to go. Uh, nobody had, had, uh, has done extensive studies on what actually the ecological uh, relations are uh, with farmer land races. So um, collaborating with somebody who's trying to genetically sequence the fungal ecologies, microbial ecologies uh, of land races, and using that as a um, as collecting data, right? Um, also farmer collectives who are calling for a return of their land races. Um, so we can start to use those data um, to then intervene at the policy level. The government of the Philippines actually started a new program where they're giving out free seeds. The seeds they're giving out are the ones that are associated with high yield because they need to give farmers income. Um, so if we can show, um, that all things considered, uh, working with farmer land races actually have kind of these sorts of, uh, let's say benefits, you know, to use a really loaded word, uh, then we can start to in intervene at the local level uh, and maybe start to distribute uh, seeds that have more kind of, you know, I don't know, better ways of working with the, uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, so sorry, that, that's just trying to answer your super big question, but please email me. I'm really happy to, to talk about this more, uh, but trying to answer it just from, from my, um, my experience. I have, a, um, I have another question here from Dan Miller. This question is to both of you. Um, uh, so when researching through or alongside historical and spatial visualization, how do you think about integrating methodological narrative and what you publish and present? Another way of putting this might be, how do your maps, visualizations, diagrams also teach a viewer about how they're made, about their attendant sources, assumptions, possibilities, and about how you practice? I mean, to give like one, I think, pretty clear example with these uh, navigational charts. So first of all, you know, we were trying to find cartographic resources um, that would help us to, you know, um, recover, you know, um, the uh, spatial organization of antebellum plantations. Um, in order to do so, you know, we located and we were told to look at the postbellum map. So, like, what does that mean? It means that in order to understand um, the, um, you know, uh, spatial organization of slave plantations, we had to go to um, a, like, a set of resources that were actually produced after slavery had already ended. 
Um, they were produced during a period called Reconstruction, um, which actually quite literally means that they were, the plantations were undergoing major socioeconomic upheaval and restructuring. That meant in many cases that the slave quarters, sugar mills, other structures on the sites were in the process of being moved closer to the river because newly emancipated people were not interested in living a mile and a half deep in the middle of sugarcane fields. And so you start to, and as you kind of peruse these maps, you realize that you're looking at three eras kind of um, held simultaneously. You have some plantations that still maintain an antebellum spatial layout with the slave quarters and sugar mill at the center of the plantation along the central axis. You have some where those slave quarters have been moved closer to the river as formerly enslaved people are now working as um, tenant farmers on that property. Um, the sugar mills start to become consolidated, so they disappear. And you see one sugar mill with, you know, um, uh, with two other plantations with no sugar mill on them, so they become sugar factories. So you realize that, um, you know, in a way, like you, you have to um, kind of look at the entire suite of um, maps um, at one time. Um, and uh, in order to understand the antebellum, you know, uh, lay, like layout, you have to understand what it is you're looking for and you have to eliminate um, the uh, postbellum characteristics um, from your analysis. Um, and so it, it requires, you know, um, it requires you to have an understanding of um, plantation organization that you know comes from resources beyond the cartographic records. You have to speak to historians. You have to do quite a bit of reading. You have to look at various you know agricultural schedules and so on and so forth. Um, cartographic resources in any type of archival material, any 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 type of um, um, you know cartographic uh, record you know, um, is going to be extremely limited, as you say, has been produced, you know, to achieve a certain aim, in this case, actually parting the Mississippi and the plantations along, you know, either side of the river's banks are somewhat incidental. Um, the burial grounds on them, even more incidental. You have to realize that as these maps were being kind of, um, were being drawn, they were drawn by a surveyor who actually traveled from plantation to plantation along the river over the course of many years, many seasons where the conditions on site would have varied dramatically. If it were flooding, would he have actually gone and visited this one plantation? Maybe there is data missing from that plantation. If it was too hot, would he have made it two miles back in the middle of sugarcane fields to find this burial ground? If there was no landowner, if that slave master had been, you know, economically ruined by emancipation, um, leaving a now vacant property, would he have been granted access at all? Sometimes he would have encountered, you know, um, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, a sharecropper who, you know, happened to point out, oh, there's a burial ground about, you know, two miles deep into these fields. Um, so the cartographic record is really, you know, just a record of, um, uh, you know, one kind of person's journey, their um, access, their contacts, the environmental conditions, um, like all of these, you know, incredibly complex factors um, that are then kind of drawn as a matter of fact that become the historic record. Um, and in reality, it's incredibly fragmented. And I guess like the most kind of faulty um, kind of aspect of these maps is their attempt to hold the Mississippi River in place. Um, the river is constantly evolving, and you can actually see this when you georeference the map on top of a satellite image. You can see where you know the river was in 1878 and where it is now, and it, and it, has, it does shift um, even with um, the levees to try to constrict it. Um, so you know, like there are a lot of um, precepts and, um, and assumptions that kind of go into the drawing of these maps. And in order for them to be of any value, you have to be aware of them, right? Um, and you have to be able to read through them. And, and then you can really mine them for an incredible amount of um, information about how people um, at that time uh, were thinking, you know, were operating and were inscribing um, those uh, assumptions, those logics um, into the earth itself. Okay. Elaine, do you remember? Do you remember the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's another really big question. I, I can give a really short answer, which is that um, uh, how I made decisions on 
I think which to present. Um, so I should say the rice project is about a 10 year project. Um, so there's tons and tons of materials. Um, I chose the one that actually uh, kind of fit uh, Lauren Adams prompt, which is to think about computation. Uh, and I also decided to present uh, the research uh, rather than uh, the projects that are kind of, uh, you know, the visual mm -hmm. projects that um, kind of come out of, uh, of this research. Um, there was just, you know, it's a 20 minute presentation and uh, yeah, I, I had to pick uh, whether to do uh, the research side so I could really talk about uh, the logic of yield and the algorithms that go into uh, creating physical forms uh, that we see in our fields and forests. Um, and using, I think, uh, for me, and this may be a larger conversation also with Imani, I think choosing a point of view and a voice uh, that's really situated. Um, uh, I'm very careful um, uh, about uh, satellite views or maps, uh, which were uh, used uh, in uh, colonial uh, projects uh, in order to tax farmers, uh, in order to translate uh, lives into machines uh, for profit. Um, so those are, I think, primary considerations uh, when I, you know, when I do present the materials, just locating myself and kind of trying to enter the conversation in a, you know, kind of very humble uh, way, I think. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think I think I'm going to. There, there are so many really interesting questions here. So I think I'm going to, Adam. We can assemble these and email them to Imani and Elaine because I think they'll be interesting um, for you. And if you feel motivated, then please, yep. um, you know, then please respond. And otherwise, you know, the students who are in the audience, at least you know, we we will we can have conversations. Um, regarding your questions um, in class, because I know a lot of our, a lot of uh, my students are here. The you know there's there's generally there's we, there's generally other formats. So please email me if there's something that you really really want to have answered that I can also try and answer. Okay. So Adam, these are easy to capture, right? All the yep, questions. definitely. I can yeah. grab these. Okay. And thanks everyone for putting these. Yeah. In. These are really great. Yeah, questions. they're really sorry great we can't get to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we, we have to move on because um, thank you so much, um, Imani and Elaine. And I hope we um, we stay we stay in touch. And Imani, when you do come to New York, you should um, come to the center and see our historical New York City project because we've dealt with like mounds of um, historical historical kinds of data that I think might um, interest you in relation to your to that historical work you're doing in Louisiana. Um, but I know that Farzan and Sam, Sam is in Australia very late at night and Farzan's in Athens uh, attending to a show that he's uh, just opened. Um, so welcome. Um, so Farzan is, um, is going to, yeah, and feel free. Okay, Farzan is going to go first. Um, he is an assistant professor in architecture at Cornell University's College of Architecture and Planning, where he directs the real-time urbanism lab, and he's the director of Farzan Farzan, <laughs> an interdisciplinary design studio working across architecture, urbanism, computation, and media. He's also taught before at GSAP and, um, and is very familiar with the approach to computation that we're um, presenting here. Uh, Sam Levine is an artist and educator whose work deals with data, surveillance, cops, natural language processing, and automation. He's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Design at, Univers at UT Austin. And again, both of these two are doing more urban uh, kinds of work, which is why they're paired and the gender divide was just chance. So no, there's nothing, nothing um, too difficult, too much to read into that. So um, thanks so much for both um, attending at such late times of the night. But Farzan, take it away. 20 minutes each and the same thing. We'll 
try to get a conversation going between you and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Laura and Adam. And it's so nice to be virtually back at GSAP and thank you for mm -hmm. the previous panelists. It was so exciting to hear your conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so as Laura mentioned, my name is Fazin Lokajam and I run an interdisciplinary um, practice called Fazin Fazin. Um, and today I'm just going to show you uh, a series of projects, actually, just thinking through this question of, um, you know, how computation impacts my work and my project. And I want to talk about a series of uh, collaborative uh, projects I've had that have somehow transformed the way I'm thinking about computation in relation to architecture and urbanism and media. Let me just get my Zoom screens all tidied up so I can see my presentation. Perfect. Great. Uh, so like many in the audience today, I work in multiple modes in media. This consists of researching with data sets, designing with algorithms, uh, fabricating with robots, engineering interactive spatial media systems, uh, building diverse audiences across digital platforms, producing films that subvert the codes of social media, creating exhibitions that push the limits of discursive and immersive aesthetic forms, and making models of smart cities and their control syntax. My, through my practice, I try to destabilize techno, the techno-utopian grounds that dominate innovation discourses in architecture and society. And so by that, I mean, I examine how new media network infrastructures and the techno sciences influence the politics of architecture and the city. Um, I've developed a method of working that uses design as a means of critical research and spatial practice. For instance, much of my recent work stems from an investigation into modernism's response to new technology and computation, but I apply this research to the most contemporary of design practices working with new media, virtual reality, advanced fabrication, um, and new spatial media in an interdisciplinary form of what I call applied technology studies. Uh, I work in this way to understand and try to redesign the relationship between computation and the multiple scales, mediums, and spatial logics of late capitalism. To understand how computational media determines our situation, how it shapes the codes of our social interactions, powers the data-driven decision-making of the buildings we inhabit, optimizes the unequal distribution of goods and resources in our cities and automates the production of human subjectivities. Algorithms, archives, cities, and subjects. These are the arrangements of concepts and sites and terms through which my practice operates, showing how all four co-produce each other and defining the spaces and architectures of each. Uh, just in terms of, you know, I think like totally honest biography, I actually had a very conventional pathway during my first decade in architecture, uh, working for design practices in Australia and Europe on large public projects shown here, where I really investigated how new digital processes could impact the logistics design and construction of architecture. Um, during the next decade, my path led me to question our inherited disciplinary conventions and the techno-utopian solutioneering at the heart of the computation and innovation project in architecture. And so my intervention into these discourses and practices is to build connections between history and theory through design to use computation to understand the processes and power structures that limit, condition, and govern what types of architectures and forms of human behavior are permissible and to ask who benefits and loses from existing arrangements and how the relationship between the computer its military origins and commercial forms of capitalization have come to bear on the imagining design and management of cities. Um, so today, I hope, you know, just to give you a sort of overview of some projects from my practice, um, I hope I will show you how my practice has evolved from exuberant form making to an exuberant form of practice through a series of important collaborations with other independent designers and scholars to make these seemingly abstract technological transformations visible, material, and manipulatable to design. Uh, 
so I'm going to do this by first mapping the evolution of my research inquiry through key collaborations with the individuals shown here um, at this timeline. Um, and so I'll get into that in a second. Um, and I just want to offer a few sort of uh, theorizations of the work, maybe, where um, I'm going to present four projects and that offer different interventions through design into this techno solutionary discourses I'm talking about. And so I'll talk about um, a project where I, I'm thinking through a counter model, um, a project where the subject is a method and the method is the subject, um, a project that's really attempting to render visible certain um, abstract and invisible relations, and a project that's attempting to amplify overlooked and underexamined uh, histories. And, and so let's start. Um, and, and so my projects, you know, over these years, my projects, I've been really interested in uh, projects over practice and continued conversations over entrenched positions. Um, this project here, your crew is from 2014 with Leah Dennis, uh, a graduate of this school. Um, from Leah Dennis, I really learned to be sensitive to the codes and conventions of digital platforms and the importance of visual design. Uh, from Mitch McEwen, this project we worked on together, I learned that curatorial design methods can be direct, fast and impactful, and the building information modeling desperately needs uh, black imagination. Uh, from uh, this project with Ava Frank, um, who was a curator who supported my, my hair before she supported my project and took the biggest risk and gave me my first commission. And from her, um, I learned to uh, continue to create the institutional spaces that practices like mine need to operate in. Uh, this project with Glenn, Joffa, Caitlin, and Leah, uh, Meisterland, also a, a professor here at Columbia, I learned to closely read the terms of service agreements and the rewriting one is both a political act and a design problem. Um, from Mark Wasuda, who is a professor here, I've learned too much, uh, but I've learned really to always be sensitive to system logics, to always locate abstraction in material objects and practices, and to not just explain, but entertain, but also vice versa. Uh, from Caitlin Blanchfield, this project, I learned the importance of bringing science and technology studies in dialogue with settler colonial studies. Um, and this project with Felicity Scott and also with Mark, uh, I think Felicity Scott, also a professor here, um, her scholarship has opened up a disciplinary space for um, my practice to follow. Um, and lastly, uh, this collaboration with Adrian LaHood, um, Adrian really showed me the importance of reciprocity, vulnerability, and the urgency of creating spaces for others to operate in. And so I know that was just like a lot of projects and a lot of things I learned, but I, these are really sort of transformed formative computational collaborations for me. Um, and so to now just talk through a few projects um, and to think about this concept of a counter model as a different way to think through the computational project. And so um, this project share um, uh, is a collaboration with um, all of these people here. Um, and so we know that digital technologies of the so-called sharing economy have been transforming our cities for the last several years. And they've also been transforming our understanding of domestic space and housing as infrastructure. Uh, with this project, I want to talk about the ways in which personal spaces are now imaged through the proliferation of sharing and digital intimacy through social networks and how these have formed spatial organizations that use different platforms, media and technology to invent individual environments of accumulated spaces, images, objects and relations. Um, and so SHARE is a collaborative project with Caitlin Blanchfield, Glenn Cummings, Joffa Kolb, and Leah Meisterland for the 2016 Oslo Architecture Triennale. Uh, it was a response to an open call commission, um, to develop a public project for the city of Copenhagen in response to the digital sharing economy and to platforms like Airbnb. Uh, so quite simply, Share um, is a digital platform, screenshots shown here, that allows users to list and reserve objects by the minute, whether in the home or in public. Uh, users define their own terms of exchange, whether monetary or otherwise, and through the listing of domestic objects and public spaces, share connects city dwellers to things they need, places they desire, and to one another. Uh, we designed, developed, and deployed this app as a counter model to the Airbnb platform. And the app is a counter model with technical features similar to the Airbnb app, but with some modified terms of exchange uh, that gives agency to users. Um, and rather than to Airbnb. And so in this sense, it presents a counter economic model for sharing spaces that go against the platform capitalism in circulation. 
now. And this is an exhibition shot of it. Um, so this next project, Modern Management Methods, uh, is really thinking about the subject as a method and thinking through method as the subject of a research and an inquiry. And it's a collaboration with Caitlin Blanchfield um, and it was presented at the Shed in New York in 2019. Um, and so I wanna talk about an example of a project, this one that analyzes architectural and historical processes. Um, and so Modern Management Methods is a research project that asks how the value of a building is produced through instruments of expertise, um, management ideologies, and historical narratives through an unorthodox survey, through unorthodox survey practices and x-ray. Uh, we use the imaging techniques of conservation and the documentary production of heritage preservation um, and archive to show how scientific methods attempt to produce stable notions of history and value. Um, so the project was looking at two different um, uh, buildings of um, two different modernist buildings, the Weissenhof Siedling in uh, Stuttgart, designed by Le Corbusier, shown here, and the United Nations headquarters in New York City. There was also Le Corbusier was involved in that. Um, and so we were looking at both of these projects because they had undergone um, different renovations um, and they were. Um, and the renovations, as part of those renovations, the historical image of the buildings were preserved, the exterior sort of iconic um, modernist legacy, whereas the interiors had been um, upgraded with new types of technologies and brought up to different forms of preservation and um, cap different forms of technical capability. Um, and so uh, for us, um, with this project, I wanna emphasize here how we thought about how representation and imaging tools could also allow us to see a building, its history and its reconstruction differently. And so we really x-ray the moments in the buildings where these new technologies or these new um, uh, upgrades to the capabilities of the building could be visible. Um, and we sort of paired this with uh, documents from a maintenance manual that was used to preserve, to manage the building, as well as documents from the UN archive that chronicled the capital renovations. And so here, um, the X-ray was a critical tool of image production and a means to understand the documentary effusion of institutional bureaucratic processes. Um, somewhere between information and image then, this method offers a view of modern architecture previously unseen, looking behind and through in a novel section card. And so the X-ray within the UN, uh, we identified all these moments where the Malians and the curtain wall had been redesigned after 9-11 to bring it up to new, uh, a blast proof sort of security um, capability. And so the X-ray, um, these sort of vignettes and details of the building shown here um, revealed the risk and securitization of a building at, and its physical and digital level. And so when new technologies kind of started to get installed. Here. Awesome. So this next project is uh, about thinking through how we can render visible uh, certain computational logics in the city. Um, and it's a collaboration, a long time collaboration uh, with Mark Wasuda, who is also a professor at Columbia. And actually we're in Athens together working on an exhibition that just opened. Uh, so here's Mark and I clearly entering the eco zone uh, in Song Do. And so this project analyzes the rhetoric of the smart city movement and its historic foundations in modernism and computation to understand the agency of architecture within an algorithmic urbanism. Uh, ambiguity and criticism surrounds this hazily defined metropolis. Is the smart city an opportunistic label easily applied to any urban development? We've seen sort of smartness everywhere. Is it a coherent global movement or a clever repackaging of essential utilities by technology companies. If the modernist city of hard infrastructure and machine logics gave way to one of networks and communication, the smart city is a shift to a kind of urban form, not just connected by neural networks, but determined by them. And while the smart city may be still, you know, one of the most powerful forces shaping the future of 21st century cities, what exactly this means is still largely unknown, I believe. Um, and so uh, this, this project is a series of exhibitions um, called Control Syntax, Rio and Control Syntax Song Do. And I'm just gonna walk you through the first one. Uh, so Control Syntax Rio uh, really started 
when we were asked to examine uh, what the sort of implications of an architectural space like this is. This is the Center for Operations Rio, um, a new kind of cybernetic smart city space that was built in the lead up to the uh, 2016 Rio Summer Olympic Games. Um, and so our project controls index Rio models a traffic route through Rio de Janeiro from Copacabana Beach, shown in the bottom, to Maracanã Stadium, shown in the top left. Both, you know, beach volleyball and soccer competition sites for 2016 Summer Olympic Games. Um, so CORE, as it's more commonly called, was built in 2010 in reaction to a landslide. Uh, CORE was planned to anticipate and respond to future disasters and infrastructure failures. Equally important, it was intended to demonstrate Rio's commitment to improved urban administration and traffic management. Uh, CORE was heralded as an urban feedback system and control center that will combine disaster response, urban sensor monitoring, and a form of intelligent traffic administration that would speed circulation during the crush of the Summer Olympics and after. Um, the technical and conceptual armature for CORE originated in IBM's Smarter Cities Initiative. Uh, CORE's primary tasks are to monitor, assess, and represent the metabolism of the city and to respond to actual or potential interruptions to drain, slow, or block it. And these are some photos from the exhibition was first installed at the Hetno Institute in Rotterdam and later was shown at storefront in New York City. Um, and so through the logic of the IBM code around which it is built, core measures abnorm abnormality according to four escalating scales of intensity, uh, incident, event, emergency, or crisis. And so how this scale is registered and represented and how it determines response form the foundations of Rio's control syntax. Um, and so overlaid on the traffic route of control syntax Rio, um, it also traces a decision path through core's uh, decision-making matrix. And so the model aligns the material traffic infrastructure of the city with the immaterial syntax of core's urban management code. Um, so at first glance, core's control syntax appears banal and managerial, yet it is also charged with potential crisis. For example, if protest erupts, then traffic will have to be redirected to avoid paralysis. If buildings explode, routes will need to be cleared to usher response teams. Explosions, fires, protests, landslides, rallies, and sudden tropical storms combined with faulty traffic lights, accidents, spilled trucks, burning buses, and quotidian congestions as elements of the core control syntax. Um, and so, the control room um, shown here for the one we looked at in Rio and another one that we looked at in Songdo is the active demonstration of urban sensing, information extraction, feedback and management, a, a theater of control, you could say. And, and so this reformation of urban vision, the saturation of the city with sensors and cameras together, we provide the spatial, physical, informational and political armature of what we are calling smart city control syntax. Um, okay, uh, so last project, how am I doing for time? I can't see, let me know if I'm doing okay. Uh, I think you're good on time. How much do I have left? Uh, take the time that you need, we're not, we're not necessarily pressed. Beautiful, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, so this last project is a little bit of a shift and it's actually a project that I've made for the Architecture League of New York after I uh, won a prize that I had been trying, uh, that I had applied for close to, I think, eight years, what used to be called the Young Architects Prize. And for eight years, um, I was constantly unsuccessful. Um, and, and so in my last year of qualification, because I was no longer so young, um, I was very lucky and honored to receive this prize. And, and so it was this moment where, um, you know, certain things that maybe I had been doing at the fringes of architectural uh, design practice proper and um, thinking through, you know, some of the sort of design projects that I just showed was, you know, being recognized. And there was a kind of a moment of um, professional uh, recognition and stability that I was um, undergoing. And, and so it kind of uh, intersected with a few other shifts and changes in my life at the time. Um, and so in this moment of uh, professional sort of recognition, um, I, I somehow started to think through uh, the technologies that were surrounding me in my domestic space, but also the technologies that had um, 
uh, shaped my entire biography and history. And I was thinking through the relationship between uh, the technology of the home and the technology of the state and uh, how immigration and uh, smart home uh, uh, sensing devices, what was the sort of relationship between each other. But I was also thinking about that uh, through my own um, body in some way. So, I, you know, I think a lot of the work I do is very invested in, um, in uh, a deep sort of engagement analysis of sites and to understand, you know, without a site, without a kind of uh, a way of reading things like an algorithm or things like control syntaxes through physical objects like sensors or um, through actual material form. Um, here, I decided that I would try to read some of these um, infrastructural network technological systems through my own, how they were registered through my own body. Um, and so this project, My Domestic Routines, uh, comprises a film and a physical installation. And the installation displays a catalog of uh, readily available smart products sourced from IKEA, Amazon, and Fives. And so I'm showing this uh, the installation here. And so a recursive routine connects these proprietary systems and casts them in a never-ending performance of detection and response. Um, the film uh, presents a composite image of Faisin Belkajan, yours truly, and my home, rendered through the attentive vision of the smart home um, industries. Um, and so it reveals how regimes of monitoring have produced a neurotic domestic subject uh, simultaneously obsessed with seeking ever more representations of his domestic life while securitizing himself against the fears lurking in the American suburban imaginary. Um, so our domestic routines may seem banal, even scripted and contrived. Um, this exhibition captures a feedback loop between domestic desire, data collection, and the insidious possibilities uh, of convenience. So I'll just show you a little bit from this, uh, but really I was um, trying to, you know, as I was sort of saying, I'm trying to connect um, uh, archival images that my mother took of my um, upbringing from my domestic spaces with uh, archival images that had been automatically created by smart home. Okay, should have come. <laughs> yeah, good now. pause it there for a sec uh, so so the film has this you know it's online I, I can share the link but it has a series of uh, different sections that uh, basically uh, came out of five weeks of installing different smart products in my home um, and it leads up to this final sequence that you're seeing here where a uh, kind of a digital avatar of myself is playing out every single possible permutation of forms of interaction and domestic behaviors that I could have uh, with these different uh, smart home technologies from IKEA, Wise, uh, Google, and Amazon. And, and so you can kind of see here, uh, I was interested in how a lot of these, uh, you know, listening devices that enter our homes are packaged up as incredibly cute, innocuous, um, friendly objects. And so here I was attempting to kind of um, create some sort of connection between this sort of cute aesthetic that we're sort of being pushed um, into by, you know, technologies like concepts like the metaverse or technologies like digital twins, um, and to sort of uh, connect that to uh, a sort of a surveillance uh, cinema 
um, aesthetic. Um, and so that's kind of it. I sort of try to show a bunch of things very quickly, uh, but I hope um, in conclusion that today I've maybe made a case for how design reveals and can intervene within the way new media network infrastructures and technological ideologies influence the politics of architecture in the city. And I also hope that I've shown that this creates opportunities for critically engaged and experimental uh, design practice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Farzan. So you can probably hear drilling in the background over here, but Sam, um, looking forward to hearing you. Hey, thanks so much. And uh, uh, great to see you, Farzan. And and, and Elaine and, and, and everyone. Great, yeah, so um, thanks again uh, so much for, for having me today. Um, I'm just gonna note that I am, as, 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 as was mentioned, I'm calling in from, from Alice Springs, Australia, and it's currently extremely <laughs> early in the morning for me. I kind of actually even like knew it was gonna be early, but then I messed up the, uh, the, um, uh, the timing even, so it's even earlier than I thought. Um, but anyway, in, in any case, just like, you know, all, all this is just to say, like you know, please you know, bear with me um, if I'm a little bit uh, a little bit uh, uh, misspoke, you know, misspeak or something. Um, but yeah, just as like a, a quick introduction, I'm, I'm an artist, a uh, teacher. I do a lot of work um, both on the internet and and about the internet, um, and I work a lot with a technique called web scraping. Um, so in this talk, I'll I'll kind of go over you know what what web scraping is, uh, why I'm interested in it. And then uh, uh, show you a few projects um, that I've made using 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 this technique. Um, uh, you know, simply put, web scraping describes uh, you know a series of techniques for automatically downloading and processing web content or converting um, online text and other media into structured data that can then be used for you know variety of purposes. Um, so in short, you know, you the user uh, write, writes a program to browse the web on your behalf rather than doing uh, doing so manually. Right. This is extremely common uh, uh, practice in Silicon Valley, um, where the data from open HTML pages is transformed into private property and in some sense becomes like the raw material from which empire is built. So, you know, Facebook notably began as like the very horny uh, web scraping project called FaceMash that allowed Mark Zuckerberg to rank the hotness of his classmates. Um, but also like, you know, Google and all of their search engines are at heart um, web scrapers, right? Um, uh, and, and, you know, web scraping is used a lot also to train these like sort of like, you know, uh, large um, uh, machine learning models that, that you see every day, like ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion, right? They're all kind of like web scraping projects in a sense. Um, the first automated, uh, automated scraper was called the Wanderer. Uh, this is like a screenshot of, it, of this sort of like announcement about the Wanderer. Um, this is a project that was born in 1993, shortly after the creation of the web itself. Um, and it was made in an attempt to track and understand the early web's exponential growth, right? So Matthew Gray, who wrote the project, uh, announced that, quote, I have written a Perl script that wanders the WWW, collecting URLs, keeping track of where it's been, and new hosts that it finds eventually after hacking it up, um, uh, hacking up the code to return some slightly more useful information. Um, I will produce a searchable index of this, right? Um, so why why did someone need to make this? Like why what is the point of the wanderer, right? And it's really like a consequence of of kind of like yeah, the so, some some like fundamental realities about the web, fundamental realities that we still face today, right? Um, so the web is both um, organizationally inscrutable, right? It's it's decentralized, it's unindexed by default, and at the same time it's open, right? So HTML. Uh, the markup language that the web is written in, uh, the, 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 or rather the presentation layer of the web is written in, is a format that's both legible to humans um, and, of course, to machines, right? So, so like that, you know, like you sort of like need, uh, because the web isn't indexed, you need to write web scrapers to understand what the web even is, right? Um, and this, this, you know, the web is like basically meant to be scraped. Um, so that this like kind of fundamental openness, right? This openness of HTML was always an intended goal of the web, right? Kind of like an original utopian selling selling point um, uh, that that encompassed this like vision of open and shared information, right? Um, 
And, you know, like, it's funny to quote Tim Berners-Lee when you're talking about the web, so I'm going to do it. Um, he writes, suppose all the information stored on computers everywhere were linked. I thought, suppose I could program my computer to create a space in which anything could be linked to anything else. Um, all the bits of information, every computer at CERN and on the planet would be available to me and, and anyone else. There would be a single global information space, right? But that openness, that openness of the web has always been contested and unfixed, right? There's that uh, the fundamental tension between the open web, uh, that vision of universal shared access to knowledge, and the artificial scarcities that are imposed by capitalism, right, in the form of intellectual property law, data hoarding, patents, and so on, right? Um, uh, and I think it's like sort of in that tension that, that web scraping allows us to do some interesting things. Um, Okay, that's one. Two, sort of what is, what when we're talking about the web, what are we really talking about? Um, again, when sort of in the early days of the web, um, most most sites were just HTML documents, right? When you looked at a, a web page, an HTML file was literally copied from the website server to your computer. Um, and while this is you know still true um, today uh, at times, um, the vast majority of, of web content that you, that you look at is stored in databases, right? So when you look at a, a site, when you look at a page, a web server processes your browser's request, it reads from a database, it, and then it generates HTML and sends it back to your browser, or it sends back data, which is then converted into HTML. In this sense, web pages aren't just simple documents, they're actually the front ends of databases, right? And databases are, you know, what are databases? I mean, it, it very, very simply put, they're like lists of things, right? Um, uh, big lists, right? Um, as readers of websites, we have access to small parts of, it, of the database that makes it up, right? To some portion of the lists that constitute it, but we don't have the ability to like directly query the database, to sort and filter it in any way we want to. And we definitely don't have the ability to write directly to databases, you know, or delete directly from them. So our access to the many databases that make up the web is mediated, it's controlled, it's made, it's made scarce. Um, and what web scraping does um, is it gives us an opportunity to re-database the web, right? We can, we can recreate the databases from which the web is generated. Um, web scraping is always an act of reverse engineering. Um, and this is sort of uh, true in, I think, two senses. Uh, uh, on, on the one hand, from web scraping, we kind of like you kind of have to learn how the web is built on a technical and infrastructural level, right? Um, but maybe more interestingly, when you kind of do a web scraping project, you also learn how the data that's carried by websites operates on an economic, social, and political level, right? And and every website is quite uh, uh, different uh, to scrape. Some are really easy to scrape, some are really hard to scrape, and that kind of varying difficulty is really directly related to, to the website's business model, right? To how much the owners of a site consider their data uh, valuable or proprietary. Um, and of course, this is, you know, this, this can be like an ironic situation, right? Because frequently the databases that make the web, you know, are populated with data that we provide or data that's about us in some way. You know, this might be data that we provide like intentionally, like, you know, when you, uh, when you post uh, text and media to social media, or it might be data that's provided about us without our knowledge or agency. Um, in either case, I began to call my own work with web scraping, like scrapism, uh, which is this kind of uh, word I made up, but you know, the, the idea of scrapism um, is that it's the practice of web scraping for artistic, emotional, um, and critical ends rather than business and governmental ends. Um, it's a process of decommodification and redatabasing, a process of eliminating artificial scarcity, and it's meant to act as a as an inversion, right? So, so you know, work always leaving data in our wake, uh, data that turns into someone else's business model or someone else's machine learning model or someone else's, you know, in the worst case, like means of repression, right? But we're kind of like all in held together, and power also leaves its traces online. Um, uh, and, and through you know, collecting, processing, filtering, and sorting these traces, certain truths can become visible. They can kind of crystallize into something, right? Um, okay. So with that in mind, um, I'll just walk you through a few projects that have made that are kind of like under this umbrella of scrapism. Um, the first is called New York Apartment. And I'm actually just gonna pop out of the slides for this. 
um, because it's easier just to show it um, as a website, which is what it is. Um, okay, great. And what is New York apartment? New York apartment is sort of like represents uh, like the totality of uh, uh, real you know, of housing as commodity in New York City, right? Uh, this is a collaboration with my frequent collaborator, Tika Brain, um, and was a commission for, um, for the Whitney Museum that has a, a digital art um, a collection called Art Court. Um, so to make this project, um, I wrote a, a web scraper and it downloaded every single for sale um, real, real estate listing in, in New York City. And then kind of combined it into this one like nightmarish space. So like if you um, combined every single apartment in New York uh, at the time of the scrape, it would cost forty three billion dollars. There'd be like sixty five thousand bedrooms, fifty five thousand bathrooms, thirty six million square feet, and we sort of break it down to like kind of like component parts of a real estate listing. So uh, the first section contains like every single question in all of the listings, right? Like. Um, are you looking for a charming, well-priced one-bedroom home in a sought-after area? Are you looking for a cozy, elegant home close to all that is held dear to in New York? Or are you looking for a deal? Are you looking for a great investment home? Are you looking for a loft, like open space with both light view, luxury kind of services? Are you looking for beautiful open views and so on, right? And then we have like all of the images from all the listings. So uh, 20,000 images of bedrooms, right? And um, I'm tethered uh, in internet at the moment. So this might be a bit slow on my end. Uh, you can kind of flip through them, they're randomized each time, uh, sorted algorithmically. So sometimes you get mistakes like this. And what's interesting about these two, I love these images because sometimes they're sort of these staged homes. And sometimes it's very clear that it's just like a person just like took the photo, you know. Um, 17,000 images of bath, uh, bathrooms, uh, kitchens, dining rooms, living rooms, doorways, closets, exteriors. And my favorite, the 2,000 images of the gyms, right? Uh, all of the uh, uh, sentences and all of the listings that begin with the phrase, the apartment, I won't read them. Um, virtual tours. So, you know, part of, of, of course, like um, apartment listings are uh, uh, floor plans. So I downloaded all the floor plans and then sort of uh, figured out a way to uh, uh, isolate uh, the uh, uh, doors and windows and doorways from the floor plans and then kind of combine them all together into these um, nightmarish uh, 3D. Uh, spaces that you can kind of like explore. So this is like all of the apartments in New York City kind of like laid out as a giant, uh, giant kind of like rats maze. And then we have it laid out as like a, a high rise and, and, a, and a pyramid and a, a sort of um, a, a very thin tower as well. You can explore video tours. So these are like these sort of automatically generated super cuts of different uh, things that people say in apartment video tours. Maybe the play will work, we'll see. Mike. Welcome, 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 and welcome, and welcome, 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 and welcome, 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 and welcome, welcome, welcome. And so you know, like it, it's just sort of automatically. I mean, there's a bunch of these. I won't play them all. Um, I do like the one that says uh, "free war." A lot. Also, maybe I'll try to play that one. Pre-war, 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 pre-war. Pre-war, 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 pre-war. Okay, that's good enough. Adjective noun combinations, of course, the mortgage calculator. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you got to have a mortgage calculator, right? So it's like, you know, like, uh, you know, if your salary is $56,000, your estimated monthly payment would be $252 million, right? Um, and so on. And then it ends with this, like, listing of all of the uh, real estate like, uh, agents in New York. Originally, um, originally we had this so that you could actually like call these people right from here. And I had a big button that would put you all into like um, this like massive um, iMessage group chat with every single person. Um, but then the, the Whitney made me um, uh, change that. So, so right now it just emails me if you, uh, if you go there, which is, which is fine, it's fine, okay. Um, so next, next up um, is a, 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 quite, a quite similar project, really, um, called, um, called Get Well Soon. Um, and if like this sort of New York apartment project is about housing as commodity, Get Well Soon is about um, uh, healthcare as a commodity. Um, again, a collaboration here with, with, um, with Tiga Brain. Uh, we were commissioned to make this right before the start of the pandemic. Um, or rather the pandemic had started, but it hadn't hit America yet. Um, and it's kind of like giant 
E card. It was the it was the concept um, made from well wishes scraped from the website uh, GoFundMe.com, right? So as I'm sure you all know, GoFundMe is like a crowdfunding website that used primarily to raise money for medical expenses. Um, and of course, it's also like this like direct consequence of like the sort of absence of a proper healthcare system uh, in the US, right? Um, to make it, we uh, again wrote a scraper, we scraped GoFundMe uh, by searching for various disease names, and then we downloaded the comments from the fundraiser pages. So this is like uh, 20,000 um, sentences um, uh, uh, grouped and sorted alphabetically. Um, and it's a kind of like, uh, uh, I guess I'd say like a kind of like contradictory archive, right? Like on the one hand, it's this this archive that is containing these really ge genuine and at times quite beautiful messages of um, uh, uh, solidarity and hope, right? And on the hand, other hand, it's, it's, it's an archive that only exists because of total systemic failure, right? So in that sense, it's an, an archive that shouldn't exist. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll just add also this, this um, uh, 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 project is accompanied by uh, an essay uh, on kind of the uh, on the kind of language of care and the language of revolution from um, Johanna Hedva, who's an artist and and writer based in Berlin and who writes a lot about um, uh, 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 ability and um, um, uh, uh, is, is I think really, really worth a, worth a read, which you could you can see if you could just go to the website. Okay. Um, Finally, uh, I'll just show one more, um, uh, uh, which is actually like a, an older work, um, uh, but I think makes sense to put at the end here. Uh, it's called White Collar Crime uh, uh, Risk Zones. Uh, this was a collaboration with Francis Singh and Brian Clifton that um, I made uh, when I was working uh, for the New Inquiry um, uh, magazine. Um, and um, uh, oh, there it is. Great. Sorry, I lost my notes for a second. Um, and um, oh, there it goes. Okay, right. Um, and sort of like if the if the sort of previous projects, you know, there are sort of these like moments in time, right? These archives of kind of like moments in time of different kind of different commodity, right? I think I think that like a kind of another way of thinking about web scraping is like the ability as you're collecting all this material is to create what you might think of as like, like, rather like a passive archive, like an activated archive, right? Like an archive that's kind of put into practice, right? Another way of saying this is like machine learning, right? So white collar crime risk zones is this machine learning system um, that attempts to do predictive policing, uh, targeting white collar crime, right? So um, uh, predictive policing, uh, uh, probably most people are aware of it at this point, but if you're not, it's a, a predictive policing system attempts to make predictions about where and when crimes will occur based on where and when uh, crimes have already occurred, right? So this is an interface as an example for a, a, a real predictive policing system called Hunch Lab. Um, in this instance, the, the software um, is predicting that there's a high likelihood of larceny in that green square, right? Um, and, you know, like predictive policing, like all machine learning, um, contains incredible bias based on, on training data. Uh, predictive policing is particularly dangerous, right? Because the consequences are really dire. And also because the data that is used is generated by systemically you know, racist police departments, right? Um, I think it kind of creates these, these feedback loops, right? Um, uh, so kind of a, a bit in response, uh, my, my colleagues and I decided to make this, you know, our own predictive policing app that would use the exact same techniques and methodologies that real predictive policing apps use, but we flipped the data set. So instead of using data about street crime, we put in data from FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Um, and uh, FINRA is the non-governmental organization responsible for regulating the financial industry in the U.S., um, to get the data, we scraped thousands and thousands of PDFs that look like this, um, looking for instances where FINRA had fined organizations and individuals for financial malfeasance. Um, this actually was the hardest part of the project, was just getting the data, which is sort of an interesting thing to think about. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, this map of New York City, right? The rectangles indicate locations where the system is predicting a high likelihood of white collar crime. The redder and darker the square, the higher the you know, quote unquote danger level. 
Um, clicking on different squares gives you more information, right? This might include like the type of crime that the system believes will occur, as well as the severity of the crime. We know by financial firms that might be institutional suspects. Uh, we also show a composite image of a most likely uh, individual white collar criminal suspect, which is a facial average of high level financial executives who work in the area scraped from LinkedIn. Uh, so like, you know, the joke, you know, it's like the individual compositions are all unique, but they all sort of merge together into like a single white collar criminal suspect. Um, the map covers the entire US. Um, and there's also an iPhone app, which sends you push notifications when you enter a high risk zone for um, white collar crime. So you can you know, stay safe. Um, and that's, you know, I think, I think that's, that's all, I'll just end it there. I have like a lot of other uh, scraping projects, but just for the sake of time, I think we'll, we'll, we'll close it there. Um, I'll just note a few things. Uh, one is that um, uh, I did an online show recently at distant.gallery slash scrapism, which has a kind of like longer version of, uh, of some of this presentation and some of my thinking behind, you know, what, what web scraping as a kind of critical art practice looks like. Um, and then if you're interested in kind of like learning um, uh, just on a technical level, uh, how to do web scraping, I've got some resources at scrapism.lav.io um, uh, uh, that are sort of in part taken from a class that I teach at the School for um, uh, Poetic Computations, it includes text and, and also uh, video lectures. Okay, great. So I'll stop it there. Um, and uh, to say thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you both so much. Incredible, incredible range, um, incredible range of things. And Sam, I just love how much you, how much work you get just from this one action, which is the scraping. And of course, because the the internet is so so chaotic, and you know, contains so many things and the the projects um, um you know are really dictated by ideas you have about the kind of data that you know is there to be collected and mined and right so there's kind of a feedback loop between this one thing that you've done and then all the things all the things that you can possibly do with it it's just endless i just it's such um such great work and then Farzan, you know, your trajectory is so different because you so ground yourself in, in architecture, which of course, you know, we are here in, a, in an architecture school. And so I really wanted one of these pre uh, presentations to be directly related to that. But the, the new work that you do is um, really opens out um, so many diff um, different methods, not only because of the collaborations, but because of um, what you learn um, through the different techniques and uh, what, what you learn from the actual technologies as well as the collaborations. And then there's that feedback loop to, you know, to the work. So, you know, in that sense, the last project is so funny, but it's so purely um, um, descriptive of, of the methods that you use for a lot of your other projects, right? Which is taking these simple devices and critiquing them for their own biases and potentials, right, in these. So, um, so I'm just curious what, uh, how you to position your own, um, yeah, whether you have questions for each other, because in, in, I thought the presentations were going to be quite similar, but they're actually really far apart in terms of the scope of methodologies. Um, yeah, it's not a it's not a question, but just maybe to add a little bit about the range of um, the you, you know the range of techniques that come out of the singular trajectory through your work. Yeah. Um, well, I I actually stumbled upon like Sam's website one like late mm -hmm. night like seven eight years ago. Yeah. And and I didn't know Sam at the time. And I think I found your website through your GitHub uh, repository for one of your uh, Web as Form uh, courses. And then I actually found your video, Jerep, 
uh, tool, which is I think where you were making all these supercuts where you were identifying a specific term. And then I found this bot you'd set up that was watching, is it CNET? Um, um, that, you know, is watching that um, uh, political channel and you were sort of like doing supercuts each day for what was the most frequent term that politicians were um, saying on TV at that day. And so I thought your work was absolutely extraordinary in terms of the way you were um, connecting um, different uh, automated tools and hitting uh, strange media archives and just revealing something to us about the logic of those things by just putting it mm -hmm. on display. So collection, sorting, uh, frequency counts. Like often I think so much of your work is about uh, frequency in some way, right? That if something is frequent, if something is visible, if something uh, occurs, uh, that reveals to us something about popularity, focus, bias, patterns. And, and so the way that I've just watched your work um, evolve um, to really kind of think through the web as a form and as this new archive. And so I was thinking about something when you were talking about the open web, and I hadn't seen you uh, give the sort of historical context of the scrapers and project, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I love it. Um, and, and so I was thinking about Alexander Galloway's kind of, when you were talking about the open web, right, like his kind of uh, uh, theorization of like DNS versus, versus TCP, is that the right protocols? And, and the DNS is this like centrally controlled protocols, whereas TCIP is something that's distributed, right? And then within these is these kind of structural logics of the web, right? That you can shut down an entire .com at different levels but then everything else is meant to spread. And I don't know, so I was just, I know you probably have like so many thoughts on this, but I was kind of curious about, um, I guess like in my work, I would be like, okay, where is the building where DNS happens, right? Like I would be like, where does DNS happen? Or like who manages that protocol or what institution historically uh, was it where, you know, this argument and the, this, um, this sort of standard came to emerge. And that would be the work I would try to do. I would try to locate the architecture of DNS, both as a historical concept that emerged through institutions, but also where that is actually physically located now. Whereas I think through your work, you're looking at sort of what archival forms or media that produces. But I was, yeah, I was curious about how you think about the structural logics of the web in this way. Yeah, thanks, yeah. I mean, I definitely think it's really interesting to think, like, I think the Galloway stuff is, is like, I, I think he's talking like a little, actually a little bit of like a lower level than, the, than the, the level I'm engaging at, you know, like, I mean, like, the, like to talk about the sort of like protocols of like, you know, like what like DNS is as a protocol, it's actually a little bit more decentralized than what you're describing, you know, like when you like make a new domain name and it propagates and it takes like a few hours to go around, you know, it's actually kind of like spreading around the internet, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and that I didn't really kind of get into that much with um, in the talk today, but I've been starting to sort of like look at um, these uh, sort of questions of like data databases and our access to them as a kind of like um, bureaucratic mediation, right? And thinking a little bit about um, uh, like like uh, 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 like. James C. Scott's like, you know, seeing like a state, right? And thinking about like how like these um uh these these sort of like front ends act as a kind of uh there's a kind of like a dual level of mediation that's happening, right? Because like so much of like what we kind of like the way that we engage with the world is like mediated through these giant corporate websites that kind of take on state-like roles, even if they aren't the state, right? You know, so like mm -hmm. GoFundMe is healthcare service for a lot of people right like linkedin is jobs is job placement right and 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 you know you can kind of list can kind of like and, and like um uh, trulia is like housing you know housing services right so like you sort of like like these these really sort of like life structuring things happen through through these corporations and then and 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 they happen through the front ends of websites right um and 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 those front ends of websites are are sort of like computational have computational rules about interacting with the the back ends the databases behind right and so for me it's become really interesting to think about like the ways in which like these different um interfaces are actually really really materially structuring 
structuring our lives through their, through their access rules, right? Right. And that's like, mm -hmm. that's how I'm starting to think about like the web and also sort of the relevance and like the power of doing something like what, like data collection, like on, on, on a, yeah. you know, you could call it like artisanal data collection, right? You know, like, you know, like <laughs> so as an individual, as an individual the, rather than, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I have a question. Is the, is everything that you do allowed, allowed? to be done like what how how will for instance chat gpt change what you do is that a kind of a scrape would you call that the same kind of scraping or i mean it's not scraping yeah. obviously but it's related right well i think like yeah. like um everything i'm doing nothing i do is is very is like really like illegal there are, yeah, it's definitely so, yeah. it's definitely um uh, violates like websites terms of service right yeah so you know the consequences for me typically are like um uh like maybe i'll get like banned from a website or something you know so right. which isn't really the end of the world or no or once you have your data set yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um you know so the, the you know the the gpt thing is interesting though because they at least in the gpt yeah gpt three is using um a data set called the common crawl right yeah. so it's really mm -hmm. hard to like it's 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 really easy to make a, well it's pretty easy to make a web scraper that just goes for a single website right, right. so if you want to like you know for some reason like get all the courses that are offered at columbia and columbia doesn't have just like a list of them as a text file that they'll send you right like it's pretty easy to like write a web scraper that'll just get all those right and it's not going to be too hard if you want to get like every single class that's that's offered at every single university in the world right that <laughs> becomes like a much larger problem yeah right and so um uh and it's also like if you want to make a search engine it's really really hard to make a search engine right because it's really hard to make a system that just downloads every single website the content off of every single website right and so people have uh, you know uh are working on this project called the common crawl the common crawl um, actually does, it's crawling the web and it's downloading as much as it can, right? So it's sort of like, if you wanted to make a, let's say like an open source alternative to Google, you might start not with trying to build your own uh, data set of all of the internet or all of the web, rather, you might use the common crawl as like a starting point, right? And it's fascinating, extremely large uh, data set, right? Of just like the whole, not the whole internet, but like a lot of the internet. And so ChatGPT uses, uses that common crawl as its basis. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so I think Ted, I think uh I think it was like Ted Chang that the science fiction writer who said like you could sort of imagine the chat GPT as a kind of ultra compressed image of the web. And that is in fact what it is, really. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way of of thinking about what it is, right? It's just right. you know, this sort of prediction tool that's just like showing you the next, you know, character or word or token or whatever um, that it that it finds that it finds on the web. Um and you know, it's also not illegal, really, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's no. perfectly, you know, within right. sort of the bounds of, 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 I guess, like, acceptable, acceptable use. I mean, I think the claims that are being made about things like that are highly, like, improbable and ridiculous, but <laughs> like the, you know, but that's, that's, I guess, that's sort of like a different, a different question. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I, there's an audience question that I think I'll ask to Sam just because we're kind of on the same topic. But I'll just say first for me, Sam, I was like very aware of your work beforehand and looked at it a lot, appreciated it a lot. But I wasn't never heard you speak of it before. And I didn't really know your um definition of scrapism, sort of like Farzan yeah. was saying. And I just really appreciated the idea that web scraping gives us the opportunity to sort of re-database the web. And that you said, and it's kind of like you're constantly putting intention, the openness to the web and the artificial scarcity and that that's imposed on us in multiple ways um okay question um uh sam when combing through so much uh information on the internet how do you decide when to stop can you elaborate more on ways you figured out how to effectively consolidate and prioritize certain info that has been gathered um i guess i don't know i mean like like some of these projects sort of like have a very clear um like I have like a really clear goal with them right so you know for like the apartment project or something right I'm like okay I want to get a slice of 
everything in New York. And I don't want to like what you know, one way of doing that would be to like to be like um the data set will update every day or week or hour or whatever, you know. But I was like, it's too it was too it was too much to to build that infrastructure. And also it didn't really add to the project, I don't think necessarily. So that became like a slice in time, right? So that website doesn't update, it just stays, it just, it just stays what it is, right? And and it, again, like it's for it's both for like sort of like technical reasons, but also just because I think it it sort of makes it a kind of nicer, yeah, like a sort of nicer little little uh little archive. Um, but like a lot of them, and you know, so like there was a very clear goal like beforehand, and then the goal helped me like kind of like limit limit the the scope the scope of the the scope of the project. I, I also think like I I I just let the outputs really shape. Um, you know, like the sort of like, I don't always know what the output's going to be when I start kind of collecting something. And so um, I kind of let, uh, you know, maybe I'll download a bunch of stuff, you know, and then I'll experiment with making something and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see if that kind of feels like it's going someplace if I need more or if it's, if it's kind of can, can, can be finished, you know, at that point. And so I think, I think it just, it, I don't know, it just sort of, you just sort of feel it out. I know that's not a really satisfying answer mm. to that question now. Yeah. Um, no, no, I mean, I think there's no perfect answer for it. So that, <laughs> that works as well as any. Mm. Um, I have another question. This one um, is, I think both of you might have a take on it, but maybe it'd be great to hear from Farzan first on it. The question is, how do you guys navigate bias in your research? Certain tools and softwares have bias built into them based on the subjectivity of those who invented the tools. There's also bias in what information has historically been prioritized as for the history. How do you navigate this? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. Um, yeah, I'm interested in, um, you know, I think I've learned this also a lot from Laura's work, actually, um, thinking through like what are the default um, conventions of certain tools that we inherit. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm quite interested in understanding the history of some of those tool makings. Um, so a, kind of a lecture, you know, today I I like the Lane's kind of formulation, like you show the research or do you show the projects. And so today I showed the final outcomes. I just showed the projects and I didn't show so much of the research. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's driven a lot of the outputs is actually thinking about some of the uh, tools that we use within architecture, new ones like gaming engines. Um, mm -hmm. and doing a kind of um, genealogy of that software in some way. Um, and so um, part of what I'm looking at within the real-time urbanism lab is uh, the sort of uh, explosion of new forms of uh, real-time visualization tools like gaming engines, like uh, concepts like the metaverse, uh, urban concepts and tools like the digital twins. Um, and, and so I trace the emergence of a lot of these tools back to the early sort of paradigm of real-time computation uh, that comes out of Cold War era projects like the semi-automatic ground environment. So um, a lot of what I'm interested in there is how uh, military values like flexibility, adaptability, modularity uh, start to shape um, our design values. You know, how many times in studio have you heard that things should be flexible or adaptive or modular and that these are also uh, computational programming concepts, uh, but these are also, these kind of come out of a military vision. Um, and so, uh, some of the research I've been doing that's looking at um, things like synthetic population simulations and um, other forms of real-time urban um, immersion tools is that um, I'm looking at how really sort of um, subtle forms of militaristic values, things like data collection things like attempting to exploit opportunity and mitigate risk. Uh, but these are sort of uh, the, I don't know whether it's biases or frames or values, that these are the kind of ways that the tools we use for urban design or for um, all forms of management of cities that they've entered in there. So I guess it's, like, for me, it's like, it's, I don't know, like I, in my own work, I don't really think about bias. I think about, I try to locate and orient myself in some way. And so that's why, I didn't quite sort of nail the argument. The reason why I was saying that I that last project uh, happened when I received some sort of professional recognition was that at that moment, I decided to turn the lens on myself. 
and to sort of register certain things through myself and to, um, I don't know, somehow pull that apart. So maybe I just went into total psychoanalytical mode, but I was trying to understand some of my own biases. I don't know if that makes sense and make work about it. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's a great question. And I think that like, one thing that's really fun to think, well, first of all, like, like I guess like there's like sort of like the question of tools, which is really, really interesting to think about. Um, and one thing I like to do is like, I, I really like to use like open source, open source tools and like, and if possible to contribute, you know, like to like give back and contribute and make my own open source tools and materials, right? And, you know, this is certainly not a way to eliminate bias or anything, but I think it's a way to forward the, it's like, if kind of like at least just sort of forward what you what the political project is that you're that you're working on and not to like pretend that there's no political project behind it you know and so that's really i think that's really that's like really important and interesting to think about um and then you know otherwise i think it's really interesting when we're thinking about like particularly like bias and like machine learning stuff right um like it's you know, you look at like this sort of like racism or misogyny or whatever, like in a tool like ChatGPT, right? Or like like in these sort of like you know like really cla you know, really classic examples, right? Or kind of like oh, um, uh, uh, show me a photo of like a nurse or something, and you ask like stable diffusion or something, and the, and it'll always be the sort of coded feminine, right? You know, mm -hmm. and these are like these very like just like uh, uh, crude, uh, you know, this sort of the crude sexism just like built into the tools. And it's, and it's just like a hundred percent because like, um, you know, it's because the training data is, 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 is also sexist, right. Um, or, or racist. And, and, and I think that like one thing that, um, you know, so it's like a mirror, it's just, it's, 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 it's effectively a mirror. Um, one thing that I've been thinking that I've like been sort of exploring and in some of the works, not all of them, is this idea that like, well, you know, what if you actually did like kind of like look through like the whole training set? Like what if you did like what would it mean, mm -hmm. for example, as like an individual to like read the entirety of the common crawl, right? Or 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 look at every single image um in uh like Microsoft Coco or like, you know, like one can of you, these big can you do that? Yeah. Yeah, you can just download yeah, the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it depends oh, what the training data yeah. is, but you know, mm -hmm. like, like you can, you know, like you can uh, look through, like you can, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. it sort of depends, and and it's also interesting because sometimes it's almost as if, um, uh, like there'll be like fit. Sometimes there'll be like a facial recognition, let's say, mm -hmm. training set, and like, and they won't let you download it, you know, unless yeah. you can sort of prove that you're. A, on the up and up or something right you know mm -hmm. um but then it's interesting to think about well who gets access to these these things and why you know right and like who wh who's like a legitimate user of a of a of, of a of a, of a data set yeah right um uh but yeah it's interesting to think about like well what if i did just go through that and and i and like i had a project a few years ago that was like going like let you subscribe to the Enron email archive, which was like a famous data set used by people making like, you know, it's old, it's it's older now and there's better things to, to kind of use, but like, you know, it was like a, a training spam filters and like a lot of like natural language processing stuff, right? right? And so you read through these Enron emails, right? Because they were, it was an early example of like, like a, a big text-based data set, right? um that like anyone could could have access to that was just like real real regular people regular people just sort of like you know chatting away and um um uh and it kind of was assumed to be sort of like neutral language in some sense and then you read through it and it's just like these like incredibly wealthy very very white like sort of corporate criminals like uh chatting with each other about their weekend plans and you're like well this isn't exact this, this actually isn't neutral language you know like mm -hmm. this isn't really like you know but but it, but there's something like really fascinating about about actually like putting you know sort of turning the human gaze onto something that's like typically only um processed by machines right yeah. and i think that that's uh always like a worthwhile uh a yeah. worthwhile exercise
Yeah, Sam, another question for you. Um, I think your work has like triggered a few questions in the audience about kind of like um, lines between various things. So uh, I, there's two things here that I'll pull out. Um, the first is just like, what are the clear lines between scraping and quote unquote hacking? I, I think you kind of already um, answered that in a way, but <coughs> if you have any specific thoughts on that or are there even clear lines? And then another one from uh, Rashmi, who said that was fantastic, Sam. Um, did you have any trouble with using images of people from LinkedIn for the composite of the likely suspect <laughs> and white collar crime map? I'm supposing uh, by trouble there, he means like any kind of weird ethical feelings around sort of reusing these pictures. Uh, no, not in that. I mean, I'm just like, if you're sort of like listing yourself as like a high level financial executive on LinkedIn, I think it's okay to use your image, you know, <laughs> but like, but you know, like, I mean, sure, you could, there, you could, you could easily imagine like, like, and these tools are used for like really, really like scary negative things, right? So it's like, you know, like that facial recognition company, like Clearview AI, which just does, you know, it's like a cop software, right, that they're making. They do, they scrape social media accounts, right? And they use that to make facial recognition that they sell to, to law enforcement, right? So there's like the, you know, the, these, there's nothing like fundamentally positive about, about like these tools or the scenario that we've found ourselves in, right? Um, and you could make, make systems and data sets that, that are like, yeah, like truly um, scary and, uh, and harmful, right? Um, I, I obviously like, try to never do that, you know, and I think that like the sort of like I have like a political project with my with my with, with my work um, that hopefully, you know, pre prevents me from, 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 you know, causing harm, right. Uh, but it's something that you have to constantly pay attention to. Um, and obviously, it's if you can, you can, you know, it's possible to make mistakes, right. Um, uh, I forgot what the other part of the question was. The other, the other part of the question was, is there, I think the person who asked the question oh, was the curious, scraping that there's a, thing. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, usually, like, I mean, I think that, like, companies might, like, want to eliminate the sort of distinction, depending on, you know, to, it, if it, it's in their interest to do so. But, like, really, it's, like, sort of, like, unauthorized access versus authorized access, right? So, like, when I look at a website, like, I, I have authorized access to look at the website because I'm able to look at it, right? You know, like, it's, like, you have authorized access to, like, look at Google Images because you just go and you can see them, right? Like you're not doing, you're not sort of like um, penetrating a complicated, a system, right? A network, you know? Um, and I, I don't think I've ever done any work myself of like actually like kind of like trying to get in there and like, you know, go someplace where um, that's like not kind of already public. I mean, part of the premise of the work is that like you, you sort of like, what you need to know is already kind of hiding in plain sight. That said, I do, I have like, I have really liked using um, data that is leaked, right? Or or hacked or whatever. Um, I just don't do the hacking myself. So if you're interested, if people are interested in that, you know, like interested in sort of exploring leaked, like hacked data sets, like, um, uh, you know, the kind of successor to WikiLeaks is called DDO Secrets, DDoS Secrets. And I definitely do recommend uh, just sort of taking a look at uh, what's what what's there and sort of having a having a poke around um, uh, by the time it's leaked it's not like illegal or anything to like go and visit the website and like download the material um, uh, uh, and it's 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 a you know the, it it's a sort of interesting it's a really interesting uh, uh, political project that those folks are are, are embarked on right um, that, that's that's worth worth a look so I'll pass it on to Farzan because I've been talking too much. Now, I was just thinking about um, the Blue Leaks archive that came out a while ago. Um, and I think The Intercept was doing some good work there. And um, that one was during the sort of height of Black Lives Matters protests, um, a series of fusion center uh, uh, websites were compromised. I think they were using like WordPress or Drupal or something, and there was a kind of update. And, and so, what came out of this Blue Leaks archive wasn't sort of uh, the sensational sort of um, uh, sort of uh, documentation of war crimes that happened in the WikiLeaks, but it was um, for me it was a kind of uh, what I found really sort of 
fascinating but problematic was that there was all these uh, PDFs and Photoshop like her terrible posters advertising like training uh, uh, sessions for different security personnel and police officers to come and uh, to train against like eco-terrorists attacking a wind farm or something. Uh, just like think about that eco-terrorists attacking a wind farm you know um, and and so it was this like really strange kind of like banal institution you could see that um, um, environmental activism was being sort of recast as domestic terrorism and that uh, within a kind of like a really sort of um, innocuous sort of photoshop pamphlet uh, police officers were being invited to come and train for that possible future scenario and I think recently with um, the killing of an environmental activist um you can see how sort of those types of training um i'm trying to remember where they haven't but you can see how those types of training scenarios play out in real life so i don't know i the point i'm trying to make is that i'm kind of interested in these uh structural seemingly banal logics that kind of come into visibility which is how does something like training sessions uh, automate and tune your vision or your lens or your bias in the same way that our rhythmic tools might. And we can read uh, an institutional logic in the same way that we can read an algorithmic logic. That's what I have to say about leaks, sorry. <laughs> All right, Laura, I think you're uh, muted now if you're speaking. I think maybe maybe it's a good time to to have some closing uh, closing yeah. comments because we're getting very late for Sam and um, and Farzan. Yeah. Well, it Farzan looks like the sun is night. the sun has come up for Sam now. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> yeah, what time is, is it there? What time it's is a, it? It's now six fifteen. Oh yeah. my goodness! Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much um, for your two hours, Elaine. Are you still there? Is are you? No, she might not actually be on her computer. Okay. Um, I just, you know, from from my perspective, just inviting the four um, people together, it's really interesting how, you know, the people who are not architects have really addressed um, themes of spatial. You know, I think, Sam, so much of your work is looking at, um, you know, apartments and you know white collar crime as played out in parts of the city you know and um Farzan's work sort of starts in architecture and goes to all these other places and there's Elaine yeah I just loved your computational crops you know and coming from a completely different um perspective from feminism and art and then and then Imani Brown from anthropology to forensic architecture you know and coming sort of backwards into asking spatial questions through computation so they're just four very very different practices you know come from a different spot starting point and are going off in different directions in the future and I think that's really what we wanted to bring to the students because our program is so much you can enter the program from any you don't have to be an architect to enter the program you can come from computational design you can from computer science to anthropology you know anywhere and beyond and but address um, questions of spatial spatial practices so so I just wanted to really thank you all. Um, they were really amazing series of of um, of presentations. If you have anything you want to just add, um, you're welcome. Yeah. I was also going to say just quickly thank you to all the attendees and thanks for everyone yeah. for submitting questions as well. We got a ton of great questions. We did not get to get to everyone, but thanks again for all those that submitted. Yeah, and, and we'll maybe. All. Come well, maybe send the questions at least to all the panelists so that you know the range because they were actually really interesting things got brought up it's just hard to yeah. read all of them out loud yeah. okay all right thanks so much everyone and we're gonna keep inviting you to things so <laughs> <laughs> consider yourselves as part of our broad network of critical computation people there's there there's actually not such a huge network in the world and we really need to all support each other in our work so consider that an open invitation okay all right thank you thanks everyone
Thanks.